Here is a young, ambitious journalist. She is eager to travel the world, to get up close and personal as she reports on issues that affect us all. She contacts editors to pitch her project. They're interested, but with no budget for international reporting, their hands are tied. Stuck and frustrated, the journalist gives up. When I was a young journalist, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch sent me to over 60 countries, covering stories just like this. Many news organizations had correspondents based abroad and bureaus across the globe. As the internet disrupted old business models, many of those stories went untold, and many of those news bureaus went dark. The issues hadn't gone away. They were more important than ever. But there were fewer journalists reporting in depth and in the frantic quest for clicks and likes, more emphasis on the superficial and news of the passing moment. It was out of these troubling trends that the Pulitzer Center began, with the mission of raising money to support journalists in filling these gaps. Our approach has always been collaborative, connecting strong journalists and outlets large and small to reach the broadest audience with an assurance to our grantees and partners of the independence that is crucial to responsible reporting. In our first year, we commissioned nine projects. Now we support over 150 a year, working with leading news organizations in print, broadcast, and online. Along the way, we have sought out opportunities for innovation as a leader in showcasing our journalism through film festivals, photo exhibits, eBooks, and more. Our biggest innovation was to make educational outreach part of our core mission. What began as a few presentations at schools and universities has grown and grown to nearly 500 events per year. Teachers benefit from the online curricular materials built to bring our journalism to even more schools. Some students do their own reporting, exploring the local impacts of global issues. Others win Pulitzer Center International Reporting Fellowships all benefit from the deeper engagement with global issues that the immediacy of journalism makes possible. The Pulitzer Center model has evolved and expanded, but it still begins with a journalist, an issue, and a story. Support from the Pulitzer Center makes the field reporting possible. Its network of news media partners and educational institutions assures that the reporting has impact. And it's that demonstrated impact that persuades foundations and individuals to invest in us, making donations that allow us to support still more journalists. To us, this is a virtuous cycle, efficiently making use of skills and resources to produce the sort of journalism that is a public good for all. So when that young, ambitious reporter comes to an editor with a strong idea, it doesn't end in frustration. It ends with journalism and with a better informed, more engaged public, one that is essential if our democracy is to thrive. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let us praise the Almighty God for His blessing and mercy so we can gather on this event without any obstacles and in a healthy condition. With all due my respect to Professor Kosuke Mizuno as a Professor of De Development Studies at School of Environment Science, Universitas Indonesia, Ms. Titi Kartitiani as a freelance journalist and photographer for National Geographic Indonesia, Mr. Dana Kencana as a journalist and, and editor at IDN Times, Dr. Sarah Cardi, as a professor of School for Agriculture, Policy and Development of University of Reading, UK. Mr. Bagja Hidayat, as a di executive director and head of the investigation desk at Tempo Magazine. And Ms. Carol Ilagan, from Philippines Journalist and Journalism Editor. And also, we would love to give our warm welcome to the Honorable Rector of IPB University, Professor Arif Satria. Dean of the Faculty of Human Ecology, Professor Ujang Sumarwan, Head of Department of Communication and Community Development, Professor Arya Hadi Darmawan, all the lecturers from Department of Communication and Community Development, Ms. Grandi Paramita as a Regional Coordinator of Southeast Asia Education Pulitzer Center, and for the honorable participant. 
Welcome to the second day of the third international conference on rural socio-economic transformation and the grand launching of Southeast Asia Journalist Scientist Transforest Hub. It is an honor for me, Erika Mutiara, and my partner, Aren Elfide Sudi, as the master of ceremony of this event. All right. How are you today, ladies and gentlemen? We hope you are all doing great, healthy, and also as excited as we are today. Yes. Because finally, after a long time waiting to, due to COVID-19 pandemic, we can attend an offline event like today. We are so happy to see you face to face. Yes. And Arlen, mm -hmm. what are we going to have today? Okay, today we're going to have another amazing session. We're going to have a view plenary session and also we we're going to have a grand launching, Erika, for Southeast Asia Journalist Scientist Rent for us. Yes, I can wait to yes. start the event. But before okay. that... Uh, before we start our event, uh, we are going to hear an opening remark from the head of the Department of Communication and Community Development. We respectfully welcome to the stage Professor Dr. Arya Hadidharmawan. Selamat pagi semuanya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, we are very thankful for the God blessings and um, I'm very happy uh, and very glad uh, to have all of you in this room and uh, with very fresh uh, face and uh, good uh, healthy. On behalf of the Department of Communication and Community Development Sciences, I would like uh, to express uh, our our thankful and also uh, to welcome all of you to the second days of our international conference on what we call as a RUSET. Yeah, usually we, we call as RUSET just just a RUSET. Yeah, the in third international conference on rural socio-economic transformation is very very long uh, title. Uh, a transdisciplinary approach uh, for promoting sustainable resilience and just rural transition in the era of climate crisis. And today uh, we add uh, another uh, program with ground launching Southeast Asia journalist scientist Rainforest Hub, uh, arranged by uh, Pulitzer Center uh, Indonesia. Uh, I think a massive appreciation goes to our speakers here, uh, Professor Kosuke Mizuno, Please stand up. <laughs> yeah. I remember uh, when I was young, I was the assistant of Professor Sayogyo and Professor Kosuko Misuno is one of the collaborators of Professor Sayogyo. Yeah, so uh, I'm very happy that uh, to have you uh, in this room. And also to special guest, uh, Professor Henny Osbar. Please stand up. <laughs> Professor Sarah, <laughs> yeah, both both of them are coming from uh, Reading University UK, our our collaborators, and uh, special thanks also to Ibu Granti, our new collaborator from Pulitzer Indonesia, and uh, we have also some students uh, just arrived from UK. Please stand up. Uh, Yeah, last but not least, uh, our uh, Dean of the Faculty of uh, Human Ecology, Pak Professor Ujang. And uh, in this room, we have uh, so many uh, le lecturer and also uh, professor coming from our uh, universities. Yeah, I cannot uh, mention one by one. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much and welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think your ideas and also your contribution will be shared and will be exchanged in this uh, event. And uh, I expect that your contribution is very, uh, uh, very uh, beneficial for our 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 scientific development uh, uh, and uh, uh, our civilization in, in in this era. 
Finally, to all participants, uh, I wish you a very happy conference and God bless you. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you, Professor Arya, for the opening remark. Now, before we start, we have a few announcements, Erika. Yes, Arlen. So, ladies and gentlemen, this event is going to be bilingual, and we have provided a simultaneous interpreter. If you are willing to use an interpretation device, you can use the device that has been given to you. And for the online participant, you can use the interpretation feature in the Zoom meeting. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to continue to our one of the most awaited agenda yes. and also our special agenda today. Okay. And it is the grand launching of Southeast Asia Journalists Rainforest Hub. And we would like to invite Ms. Grenti Paramita as a regional coordinator of Southeast Asia Education Pulitzer Center to give us a brief presentation about Southeast Asia Journalists Rainforest Hub. So please welcome to the stage Ms. Grenti Paramita. Good morning to all of you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, thank you very much for uh, attending this event and taking the time to actually share the space with us today. It is with a great pleasure uh, for the Pulitzer Center, me and also my colleague here, Bapak Haris Riyadi, to uh, deliver and introduce to you the new initiative that we have, the Southeast Asia um, Journalist and Scientist Hub. Um, next, please. So the Pulitzer Center uh, on Crisis Reporting uh, raises awareness on underreported global issues. Um, we supported the quality journalism across uh, all the um, media platform and a unique uh, program uh, for education and public outreach. So uh, at the moment, we're also working in other agents, um, in other agents like the Congo Basin and also the, um, the Americas or the Amazon, uh, Amazon forest. So we have the vision to um, uh, actually, we are delivering the largest single source of money for global enterprise reporting and the only one incorporating this reporting into comprehensive education program that extend the impact of the reporting uh, of the fellow and also the grantees that we supported. We are also trying to allow the students and the public to engage directly uh, on the issues. So the result is a sustained uh, reporting and outreach uh, on topics that range from the land rights, climate change, uh, deforestation, and also we're trying to have the interconnected uh, problems delivered to uh, other uh, education institution as well. So we uh, have uh, different departments uh, at the moment, and we just uh, launched this uh, new department in Pulitzer Center called the International Outreach in Education, where we are trying to um, introduce our work to the world. So we have, uh, for example, like uh, art exhibitions uh, upcoming in Thailand, for example, and also we're going to engage uh, lots of schools in uh, Congo Republic as well. Uh, we also have uh, different campaigns uh, being delivered in, in online uh, and through Instagram platform to engage youths uh, in uh, Southeast Asia as well. So please do uh, follow us. Uh, next, please. So um, our primary uh, projects uh, at the Pulitzer Center that works around the environmental issues and devastation, we have two um, projects. So the first primary um, fund is the Rainforest Journalism Fund here. And um, it's very similar to our Department in International Education and Outreach. We are working in uh, the three regions uh, in um, 
Amazon forest and also in the um, Congo Basin as well, so in, in Africa. So uh, the Rainforest Journalism Fund actually represents a major investment in international environment and climate reporting. I think we are the only um, uh, center and also institution that uh, focusing in the work of uh, journalism and environmental and represents a major uh, investment in that issue. Uh, yeah, so in, in the RJF or the Rainforest Journalism Fund, uh, it's a global initiative to raise the visibility and ambition of environmental reporting across the three regions. We are supporting the original independent reporting uh, projects on issues such as deforestation, land rights, climate change, among others. We also provide uh, training opportunities and trying to foster a global network of journalists um, that interested in environmental issues. Um, and also, if you are interested, and I hope you're excited as we are to welcome all this work, uh, please do check uh, our website as well. And we have, um, have this website actually translated into different languages because uh, actually the equality, diversity, and inclusion is at the heart of our um, work as well. So the RGF has supported uh, 186 projects uh, from 2018. So it is not uh, it is not long. Uh, it hasn't been that long, but uh, we're still continuing to support these projects around the world. And at the moment, we have uh, 825 reports getting published, and I'm sure. Uh, we have more, uh, actually, because at the moment there are lots of openings as well uh, under the RJF. For example, we had the biodiversity uh, call, uh, and now uh, we have another one focusing on Mekong region as well. So uh, the other project that I'm uh, I wanted to introduce to you is the Rainforest Investigations Network. So the RIN, uh, what we call it, uh, trying to harness the investigative reporting uh, and cross-border collaboration in tackle um, uh, the intersection of climate change, corruption, and governments in the world's three main tropical rainforests. So the, uh, at the moment, we are uh, supporting the in-depth stories. Um, in the three regions, and it, it is being built with quantitative analysis and investigative journalism, and with the methods of following the money and the data driven. So we're actually working with the most passionate journalists around the world, and uh, they have been producing lots of um, challenging stories that uh, probably for some people it's, um, it's uh, quite difficult to, to be told. But um, this is a really amazing work uh, from our fellow, so I, I really encourage you to, um, to check out uh, this amazing investigative report done by our uh, network and fellow here. Um, in RIN, uh, we have the systemic approach, so we connect cases to a larger scheme or trend, um, and other things is that we're trying to establish a common methodologies facilitating collaboration and build capacity for data-driven investigations. Next. So if you see uh, on the uh, left-hand uh, side here, we, we have been working with the biggest uh, media outlet uh, and the best ones. And also, uh, we are also working uh, with uh, the, the small media outlets too. So we are working with lots of uh, passionate journalists so for example, here uh, we have the uh, work with NBC, El Pais, and El Pais is actually the Spanish newsroom with a big reach in Latin America. And also uh, we have uh, work with uh, 360gradeos.co, it's a Colombian legacy newspaper um, and the startup newsroom for 360 grade. And the impact is already um, seeing a really great result for the RAN. So we have 265 pieces of coverage, uh, three billion, uh, three and a half billion online readership, and we have estimated a coverage of 10 uh, million views uh, and social shares. And we also have the 135, uh, 100 
YouTube views. So the impact uh, is already uh, very diverse and very encouraging um, because if you see the, there's a lot of um, uh, discussion uh, that's been triggered by this report uh, that's reported by our fellows. And also we're trying to have the investor to be better informed through our reporting and hopefully uh, this uh, also uh, this reporting has helped uh, the local communities to get help on the legal. Yeah. So uh, the first cohort uh, on 2021, we had the 13 fellows. So that's including Pak Bagja Hidayat here that will be delivering a session to you all. And we have a new cohort of uh, the fellows in 2022 uh, of uh, 19 fellows from 20 countries, 20, 12 countries, sorry. Next. So this is the examples of, of our underreported stories. Uh, if you see here, it's, it's very um, varying and very diverse. So for example, we had the re reporting of the food estates. So covering the uh, political power play uh, that's uh, discussed and support the food estates project that's been deployed in Borneo and also other region in, in Riau and Sumatra. And if you see in the middle, we also have like the gender related re uh, reports as well. So uh, trying to see the, the gender lens of the forest communities. Uh, another things that are interesting is uh, we also uh, have the report on biodiversity as well. So on this, uh, on this stories, we are discussing about the homeless giants and the Sumatran elephants. Next. So I think one of the strengths of our uh, reportings here is uh, how uh, the, journal the journalists and also the fellows uh, is able to present uh, the, this really important issues and uh, reportings very creatively in a very creative way and in, in engaging manner. So for example, we have like the news game uh, in Compass being published in Compass. Uh, also, we have like the short videos uh, published in YouTube, and we are also um, having some podcasts in Spotify as well. So, what is the Southeast Asia uh, Journalists and Scientists Hub? So, basically, this hub uh, trying to facilitate underrepresented voices from forest community, the affected community, and local stakeholders uh, as local journalists and academics. We are also trying to share the highlights of underreported stories to academics and explore the solutions, ultimately to enrich the diversity of knowledge coming from journalists. And also through the hub, we want to bridge the meaningful interaction between journalists and academics to help solve the challenges in rainforest. We are also wanting to explore the possibilities of having the, the underreported stories as the academics potential research object uh, and commonly engagement activities to collectively contribute in addressing the challenges in rainforest. We can go to the next slide. So uh, the hub will try to foster the dialogues and collaboration between the scientists and journalists to address pressing rainforest issues. So we will have, uh, for this year um, at least, we're going to have three di different projects and work streams. So the first is rainforest seminar series. Uh, we're going to have five this year. So uh, this morning actually marked the first seminar for the rainforest seminar series. The series is trying to uh, address the trending topics around rainforest and urgent underreported stories from the lens of knowledge and journalism. Our ultimate goal is to bring scientists and journalists closer to achieve better informed decision in public affairs through the forums. And the second is impact seed funding. The impact seed funding want to facilitate the collaboration project between RJF and RIN fellows and also with the scientists to further the impact of their uh, interrelated work around rainforest. And the last is uh, we're going to have the popular academic writing training. So we're going to have uh, opening for the participation of this training for open for the academics that are um, interested in 
uh, learning about um, journalism and writing in mass media. So this is a capacity building program for scientists who uh, want to learn journalists and this program will have the partnership uh, with uh, the big media outlets such as probably the conversations or probably Tempo Institute. We're still exploring options about that. So uh, I have uh, mentioned to you about the three activities that we have of under the Rainforest Seminar Series. Uh, it's a dialogue platform for uh, the journalists and academics. We're going to have five this year and please follow uh, our socials to know more about this seminar series. Um, for the ISF, the Impact Seed Funding, we're going to grant uh, two to three collaboration projects. Uh, and the last, uh, about the writing training, uh, we're, we're going to uh, have the aim to support for the academics wanting to learn the, the journalists and writing in mass media. Um, for the second seminar, uh, under the seminar series, we're going to have it in Borneo, hopefully. And for the third seminar, we're going to have, uh, have it in uh, Riau or, or South Sumatra. Uh, okay, we can go next. Okay, I think this is reaching the end of my presentation, so please do uh, take note of my uh, contact if you are interested to build the partnership with us. And that concludes uh, our, um, our presentation from the Pulitzer Center of Southeast Asia Academics Journalist Hub. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for Ms. Grenty for your presentation. And please uh, join us downstairs because we are going to have a symbolic lunch. And we are also invite Professor Arya Hadi Darmawan as the head of Department of Communication and Community Development to join us. And Professor Ujang Semarwan as Dean of the Faculty of Human Ecology to join us for a symbolic launching. Yes, exactly. All right, in the count of three, please hit the gong. Together? Okay. <laughs> okay. Southeast Asia Journalist Scientist Rainforest Hub has been launched. Thank, Thank you, you so much for Professor Arya, Professor Ujang, and also Ms. Grenty. Please uh, stay, uh, stay on, on the stage yes. because we are going to take a picture together. So for the photographer, you can take a picture. Okay, okay for the uh, documentation, you can come forward. Okay. Let me count. One, two, three, smile. All right, thank you so much for Professor Arya, Professor Ujang, and also Ms. Grenty. You can go back yeah. to your seat. Thank you. Okay, now ladies and gentlemen, we are going to our first plenary session of the day. For this session, we are going to discuss about communication for development and social justice that will be presented by Dr. Sarah Hardy from University of Reading, UK, Mr. Bakja Hidayat from Tempo, and Ms. Carol Ilagan from Philippines. Yes, and in this session, the presentation and also discussion will be guided by our amazing moderator, Dr. Juara Pelubis. And now please welcome to the stage our moderator and presenter for this plenary session.
For Dr. Juara Lubis, the stage is yours. Terima kasih. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm very proud to lead the, this session. To borrow uh, Pa Rilus' term yesterday, I'm the driver of this session. And I'm very proud being a driver here. You know, uh, people from North Sumatra like me usually work as a driver in Jakarta. <laughs> but I'm very proud. Why? Because the bus is very good. The speaker is good, are good, and the audience also very, very good. So I'm very proud to lead this session. And this session, we will hear three uh, speakers. The first is uh, Ate Carol Iligan from Philippines. Uh, Ate is a local term in Philippines uh, for sister or kaka or old uh, older woman ate i know that because i'm uh, i i stay 3 years in philippines the second speaker is pa bagja hidayat from tempo and the third speaker is uh, ibu ibu is madam in indonesia ibu sarah karde uh, I don't want to take more time because I'm, our time is very limited. Uh, so uh, the, all speakers will talk about uh, 15 minutes only, and then we will have 40 minutes to discuss after the three speakers. So uh, according to the newest uh, schedule, we will first hear to uh, Ate Carol Ilagan and the topics of uh, her speaks is meaningful collaboration and lesson learned from RIN, Rainforest what's that? Investigation, Investigation Network. Network. Uh, are you ready? Uh, Ate Carol Ilagan? Unfortunately, he cannot at attend this meeting in uh, magandang umaga, Ate Carol. Magandang umaga is good morning. Okay. I'm very happy uh, to hear and lead uh, our discussion. So, so, okay, please, 15 minutes for you. Sige. All right. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was just wondering if I could share my screen, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I just wanted to check if um you can see my screen. <laughs> okay, maraming salamat. Thank you. Again, good morning, everyone, and thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for the warm welcome. Um, I uh, am very happy, and uh, I take it as a privilege to be able to join you all because I think um, we have a lot to learn from each other. So um, in the next 15 minutes or so, I'll be sharing some of the lessons um, we've learned from working with the Pulitzer Center's um, Rainforest Investigations Network. Um, I've had the privilege of being uh, among the first cohort of fellows along with my colleague um, Bagja Hidayat of Tempo uh, last year. So um, I'll be sharing some lessons from Rin and at the same time, I hope that um, our lessons could contribute um, to answer two key questions that um, we aim to answer for, for this session, which is which are 
how could we make the process of land conversion more fair? And what are the communication strategies that are helping to empower people in villages and forest communities? So again, um, I'll be kind of um, uh, discussing uh, the context or the lay of the land, and at the same time, also sharing perspective from the journalism uh, side. And I think there will be a lot of um, maybe useful insights as well as I understand um, uh, our audience here is wider and not just from the journalism side, but also, of course, from our education or academic community. So let me start with... Um, okay, so this map, as you can see here, is from the Global Forest Watch, uh, showing tree cover loss, emerging hotspots, and places to watch. So as you can see here, um, it shows how few stories and issues actually are more urgent and global than the destruction of the planet's tropical forests. So as you can see here, a lot of the countries that um, are hotspots, um, uh, Southeast Asia, the Amazon, and the Congo Basin region. Now, if we look at Southeast Asia in focus, as we know, Southeast Asia is home to roughly half of the world's tropical mountain forests. So that means ecosystems in our region support massive carbon stores and tremendous biodiversity, including a host of species that occur or that we can see nowhere else in the planet. However, a new study uh, suggests that these havens are in grave danger. Perhaps this is also not new to us, of course. Um, but the conversion of higher elevation forests to cropland is accelerated at an unprecedented rate throughout the region. Um, a study um, published in the Nature Sustainability, which was also published by Monga Bay, shows that in Southeast Asia, researchers calculated that 610 thousand square kilometers of forest, an area larger than Thailand, had been lost from 2001 to 2019. Okay. Alongside that fact is where the destruction of forests happens, decline in democracy also persists. So this map from Freedom House shows how across the globe, freedom has taken a backslide with more countries in the global south less free. So as you can see, if we kind of overlap or compare it with the Global Forest Watch earlier, where you can see the hot spots um, in the Amazon region, Congo Basin, and Southeast Asia. Recording stopped. You will also see um, uh, similarities in terms of where um, the decline in global freedom is. So those are the areas with the orange um, uh, color. So the case for journalists and activists in these regions um, have also not gotten better either as freedom of expression inherently is also under threat. So you can see here the Global uh, Press Freedom Index as well from Freedom House. So as the climate crisis intensifies, the situation for journalists, activists, frontline communities, and defenders of the earth Recording is also in getting progress. worse. A global witness in 2021 reported that on average, data shows that four defenders have been killed every week since the signing of the Paris Climate Agreement. But of course, this figure is probably also an underestimate. The recorded attacks were reportedly linked to resource exploitation across logging, hydroelectric dams, and other infrastructure, mining, and other large-scale businesses. Logging was the industry linked to the most murders with 23 cases, uh, including Brazil, Nicaragua, Peru, and the Philippines. And as we all know, of course, the window to prevent global temperatures from rising is rapidly closing. Decisions that are to be made this year could determine whether the target will be met. 
So perhaps, again, no story is more international or intersectional than climate change. And while journalists and activists are continually under threat in many climate-vulnerable countries, I think for the most part and because of the work being done by a lot of organizations, including the Pulitzer Center, collaborations have made it possible for us to report and shed light on these issues because collaborations also mean pulling resources and skills as well as managing exposure and risk. Uh, of course, uh, we all know that the journalism business by nature is um, competitive. Um, before or maybe until now in some um, uh, countries, um, getting exclusives typically is what newsrooms dream of. But over the years, we're learning, we're realizing that perhaps it's even more radical to tear these walls of competition and exclusivity and work together. In the context of reporting about forests and climate change, making a case for collaborations is easy, is not, if not imperative. However, on the practical note, um, how do we... How do we begin? <laughs> what if there are no leaks, which as we've seen, um, which as we've seen have been crucial in some of the most powerful investigative collaborations we've seen in the past decade, similar to the work being done by uh, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists when they broke out the Panama Papers or Paradise Papers. And at the same time, um, not all stories may be a subject for collaboration because of obvious limitations. But this is where um, our experience from the Rainforest Investigations Network um, were able to draw some lessons and perhaps some practical tips uh, that I hope um, uh, that I wish to share. And I'm sure my colleague Bagja Hidayat would also have a lot to um, to share as well. So I'll be sharing some lessons from the Rainforest Investigations Network, also keeping in mind of the key questions um, that we hope to answer for this session. How can we make the process of land conversion fair? And uh, what are the communication strategies that are helping empower people in the village and forest communities? All right, so um, basically I've, um, I have some four uh, uh, tips that I hope I can cover with the rest of the time that I have. So when we talk of collaborations, um, uh, we talk about finding a common ground. And it's not just collaboration for collaboration's sake, wherein you, know, you want to work with um, another journalist or maybe with another colleague. But um, there's really a common ground for the two parties or even more parties to work together to be able to shed light uh, on an issue more comprehensively. So first is tracking the supply chain. Um, understanding how the trade of commodities is driving deforestation worldwide opens avenues for a lot of collaborations. So um, surprisingly, when I first joined the Rainforest Investigations Network um, uh, last year, I was really over overwhelmed by the fact of um, working on stories um, about supply chain because in the context of the Philippines, for instance, we do not have a lot of um, publicly available record on supply chain or let's say, for example, where does palm oil from the Philippines go or where uh, do our nickel um, go, for instance. Um, and we're not even sure whether that kind of information is uh, maintained uh, or in an organized way. Uh, but surprisingly, in the course of the experience with Rin and I met um, other journalists, like for example, um, uh, Granty mentioned um, NBC uh, earlier, uh, we were able to uncover uh, what happens in the supply chain, um, connecting Philippines to Japan and the U.S. So um, key sources would be export and import data. It's also useful to look at financial statements and corporate disclosures. Um, 
uh, because uh, a good thing to keep in mind is that um, companies that are publicly owned are subject to detailed disclosure laws about their financial condition, operating results, managing compensation, and other areas of their business. So uh, that was very uh, surprising to us when we saw that the information that we needed are actually available <laughs> online. And I'll show some examples um, uh, later. Um, talk to industry experts, of course, and civil society and researchers, because often um, we interviewed a lot of um, uh, environmental group groups, uh, not just in the Philippines, but in Japan as well and in the U.S. And they've been doing this work uh, for a long time already. So to them, it's not surprising to find out that, let's say, nickel from the Philippines go to Japan and then the U.S., and of course, um, uh, some have also succeeded by following trucks, um, barges, and ships. So actually tracking uh, where the commodities um, go might not always be advisable given um, uh, security issues, but some of our colleagues at, at Trin have tried doing this as well. So some of the stories that we've come up with, um, this is um, by my uh, colleagues at Tempo, Bagra and Dini. Um, so they reported on how timber from Indonesia are exported to the USA, China, Australia, and India, and of course, exposing the issues that are left um, in Indonesia. Uh, for the Philippines, uh, this is the collaboration that we did with NBC News. Um, we found that um, nickel from the Philippines uh, is being used for the batteries of Tesla cars, which are supposedly, you know, um, they are supposed to be clean uh, or green cars. So essentially what we learned is that the transition to clean energy is pressuring mineral-rich countries like the Philippines and nickel mines in this particular island, which is the last ecological frontier in the Philippines, to dig even more. So as I mentioned earlier, some detail may be in plain sight. So this is a screenshot of a financial statement uh, where you can see uh, where uh, the sales uh, are happening. So there's a mention of China and Japan. And I mentioned earlier also the financial disclosures by companies. So this is a screenshot of a press release by Sumitomo. So Sumitomo supplies um, uh, material. So this is the from the nickel from the Philippines to Panasonic, which produces the battery for Tesla cars. So this is the supply chain, actually. Um, and then... Um, this is a more um, comprehensive um, chart which we got from the annual report of Sumitomo. So um, the Philippines is here, the Rio Tuba and the Taganito um, nickel mine. So then it goes to Coral Bay where it's processed and then it goes to Japan and then eventually to the customers. So that's Panasonic and then eventually Tesla. So again, um, uh, these records we tried to verify also with um, other interviews and other data as well coming from the U.S. side. And of course, getting the side of the companies as well. Uh, you also have useful websites like Trace. So Trace is a data-driven initiative that provides information in, on trade and financing of commodities, driving deforestation worldwide. So this is publicly available so it might be useful to check it out especially if you're looking at specific countries all right the next tip that i would like to share is of course um, following the money uh, large scale or industry scale operations require big investments and loans so which companies will profit or maybe stand to lose um, from these operations? So it would be good to look at how banks, investors, and other institutions help finance companies or maybe even look at the role of offshore. Um, this is where the term ESG uh, would be very helpful. So looking at the ESG cri criteria, the environmental, social, and governance criteria are a set of standards for a company's operations 
uh, that socially conscious investors use to screen potential investments. So the environmental criteria considers uh, how a company performs as a steward of nature. So how are they exposed to deforestation risks? So, so far, we've seen some of the stories following the money. Like, for example, um, uh, this is uh, published um, uh, under the Panama Papers um, uh, with the International Consortium of, of Investigative Journalists. Uh, this looks at um, how leaked records reveal offshore's role in forest destruction in Indonesia. So documents coming from an offshore law firm called Appleby and its other corporate service providers, um, they show how um, they have helped a company called April. Uh, I believe it's a natural resources company, paper in particular, uh, structure its operations despite questions about the company's environmental record. And it might also be useful to check out. There's another website. So, so this is kind of similar to Trace, which is also publicly available. But it looks at uh, forest and finance um, data. So the chart that you're seeing here are Philippine banks um, that are giving loans uh, to companies that might be risks uh, to forests. So they have a more um, detailed um, data, which is also downloadable. So for example, here, um, so you can check also uh, by country. I just checked for the Philippines. So these are uh, <laughs> very quite popular banks in the Philippines, which we have our own savings account. <laughs> so you can see them um, giving loans to companies like Wilmar, um, Olam, um, Royal Golden uh, Eagle, Eagle Group, and they work in the sector of palm oil and pulp and paper and rubber. So again, this is publicly available, so that might be able to uh, provide a speech on where to start. So here, if I were to work on this um, uh, as a collaborative project, um, my side would be covering the banks, and I might. Um, uh, look into uh, the countries where Wilmar or Olam or RGE are operating and see how their operations are affecting the forests and communities in their area. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the reminders. So I'm wrapping up. Um, uh, another tip is, of course, using the contracting lens. Um, governments enter into contracts with private entities and individuals for resource exploitation or land use conversion. So it's important to establish the key actors in the contracting pipeline to understand the responsibilities and regulations. Check ownership, the extent and location of land concessions and, and global commitments. Uh, so here, I just wish to share this um, story published by our colleague from Malaysia. Um, uh, this is about how this big company owned by powerful people will clear forests um, in Pahang in Malaysia, which has been a forest reserve. And there will be, um, it's a land grabbing issue also. So indigenous peoples um, uh, will, uh, will lose um, their home essentially. And finally, for my uh, last tip would be looking for solutions. Our role as journalists is, of course, to expose wrongdoing and track accountability. But there's also a greater need to provide credible examples of solutions to problems. So uh, these are not the feel-good type of stories, of course, but really looking at the effectiveness of a particular solution. So more on the effectiveness, not so much on the good intentions, because you know that's kind of a given already. So really tackling how it works and maybe also why it might not be working as well. Not, not everything, of course. So again, we have great examples from uh, Pulitz Pulitzer Center um, supported stories. So this one is an effort by four countries, Cambodia, Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam. And basically, they're looking at um, efforts being made to restore forests um, in Southeast Asia. 
So um, I will end here. I believe um, my time is up. Uh, but again, just to um, kind of conclude the presentation on also building e equity into collaborations. So of course, this will this is where trust, confidentiality, and um, equal access to resources also come into play. Um, I'll end here, but I'll be happy to answer your questions um, later. So again, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, last year's uh, tempo, uh, I mean, in five last years, uh, tempo focused on to environment because uh, uh, after Paris Agreement 2015, uh, Indonesian have a commitment to decrease uh, carbon emission on the NDC proposal. And this is a national determined contribution, uh, decrease uh, emission carbon uh, 2030. And then after that, we focus on to uh, uh, environment issue and focus on to deforestation. Why? Because the deforestation is a lead of uh, mitigation um, regulation on the decrease uh, emission carbon. And we want to know and we want to see how the regulation on the paper and uh, match on the on the field. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, when the uh, Pulitzer's center open up the uh, uh, rain rainforest information network uh, tempo involved in them and then i as a fellow last year so last year we uh, uh, we have uh, four projects uh, on the deforestation and uh, i went i want to tell uh, two of you about the two projects on the deforestation in the papua and uh, before that, the deforestation in Indonesia is uh, very interesting and very important. Why? Because we have so many terms, so many de definitions, because deforestation related to the definition of the forest. Mm. We have so many definitions of the forest, mm. land of uh, 0 0.40, uh, uh, 25 hectares, uh, hikes, the trees is uh, 5 uh, mm. meters, and the cover, the, the, the forest coverage, thirty percent. What the impact of the definition is the powerful to our regulation, because if you destroy the forest, but the forest is still uh, above thirty percent forest coverage, mm -hmm. the land is still forest, mm -hmm. not deforestation. That is yeah. only degradation. Mm -hmm. 
So what the impact is the government can give the concession on the de forest degradation. Mm. That is that is the problem, mm. and uh, we can debate. We can we can uh, uh, about the the definition. That so uh, we see the Papua because the the Papua the, the forest of Papua is the last our frontier after Sumatra, Kalimantan, Sulawesi has. Uh, we have, uh, if I'm not mistaken, now is our Indonesian forest, 35 million hectares is deforested. So that is the problem. So we should see the, the Papua uh, because the last frontier and uh, the, the, the thing of uh, definition of deforestation is on the regulation, on the bylaw, Indonesian government have uh, two definition of the deforestation: planned and unplanned deforestation. Unplanned it means that uh, forest fires, uh, illegal logging, and so on. And planned deforestation is deforestation by the law. The government give or uh, license to the to the companies to cut the trees and sell the forest products and we can see the, the, the Papua right now is uh, uh, Papua is uh, sorry, uh, 41 timber companies in there and the land area concession is more than 5 uh, million uh, hectares and uh, but uh, that is uh, it is all Papua yeah? Papua, West Papua and Papua because Papua is separate uh, two provinces right now, uh, Papua and West Papua, 41 timbers. And uh, uh, I don't know how many uh, companies on uh, plantation. I mean, uh, 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 palm oil plantation. Mm -hmm. Because after the HPH, uh, timber concession, the, uh, that is the secondary forest, and then after that, they open up to uh, uh, plantation. So, yeah, and uh, now, uh, and we know that uh, Papua is uh, declared that uh, uh, Papua Barat, I mean, uh, West Papua is declared conservation uh, province. So, this is a treat uh, to the declaration. Next. Yeah, uh, like, uh, yeah, we found that the operation on the, on the, on the, on the, uh, uh, timber uh, uh, companies and uh, three in Papua and uh, three in West Papua. Uh, we can see that on the satellite imagery that uh, uh, like uh, Prabu Alaska, this is uh, the companies. You can see that the, 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 the red one is uh, uh, the cutting the trees mm. and uh, the yellow one is uh, 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 concession. I mean, uh, RKT, RKT Rencana Kerja Tahunan, mm. annual planning work uh, by companies. Mm. But you can see that uh, the annual work is uh, the in the yellow yellow box. Mm. But the day cutting trees on the outside right. of the mm. of the, yeah, yeah, of, yeah. the uh, of the of the box. That is mm. that is the violation by the law. But why the government not can find the violation? And we found that, and uh, next, and we found that. But the the question is why the the companies can sell the forest product to abroad, to uh, Arab Saudi, to Australia, to Japan, to China, and so on. Why? Why the violation of operation timber companies can sell the forest product to abroad? Must be uh, something wrong on the on the on the monitoring. So next, yeah, the main uh, evidence we found that on the this uh, uh, coverage is we have a lack of SPLK system. SPLK is system verifikasi legalitas kayu forest uh, system on forest. Uh, verification and legality. So by the the, the system, uh, uh, all timber companies should be audited by the 
uh, by the organization and report to the gov government. And if the operation has the violation, they cannot pass, pass the SPLK system. SPLK system is a good innovation of our uh, government. Uh, after after uh, a Bali Bali conference uh, in I think I 2007 uh, to against the deforestation and uh, uh, illegal logging uh, SPLK system uh, launched and then this is, this is the strong and good system but the strong and good system we found that the law call what is law call is uh, independence of auditor body why because the auditor body can get paid by timber companies. Mm. <laughs> so we can see and we can imagine that uh, if I pay somebody to audit me, so I can drive the result, right? So that is the, the, the problem. When we ask to the government why you, why the government cannot close the law fall, uh, the answer is, this is the very, very expensive. Uh, the, our budget, uh, budget public cannot uh, cover up the, the, the cost to pay uh, uh, auditor body. And the second one is uh, auditor audit transparency. Uh, the audit uh, come to the concession, but we don't know how <laughs> they do about the audit. So that is uh, the cost and governance is the big problem in Indonesia. Uh, uh, on the environment issue, I mean, and uh, how the, the, the forest management, uh, 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 how, how, how we who manage the, the forest product and, uh, and so on to related the sustainability uh, management. SPLK, SPLK is uh, the good system to provide the sustainability management on the forest, but they uh, still get uh, have a low hole. And um, I think that is the, the main problem on the, on the our forest management. Next, yeah, on the corruption issue and the or environment issue, the, the media, especially in Tempo, should be uh, or always focus on to mapping the actor. Because why? Because uh, maybe uh, you familiar to the the term is the state capture of corruption, right? Yeah. Corrupt corruption by the regulation. Mm. So that's uh, like uh, the Papua uh, example. And why the should journalism should map the actor because that is related to the political system. It's very ex expensive the political system in Indonesia. So the political actors should be engaged to the our uh, religious people, and we call it now is the oligarchy. That is the that is the our finding on the all. Uh, environment issue coverage in the last five years. Uh, you can see that the uh, how we know that the ex very expensive uh, political system. This is the research uh, by Mr. Pramono Anuwibowo. Now he is the cabinet secretary on the Jokowi administration. In 2013, uh, Mr. Uh, Pramono Anung uh, depends on his di di uh, dissertation on the uh, Pajajaran University, that he, he found that the member, parlam, uh, uh, member parliament candidate spent 200,000 uh, US dollar to for campaign. If we compare to, uh, sorry, uh, 1.3 million, but the uh, earning as a member parliament only uh, 200,000. Uh, that is uh, uh, lack of uh, 
money of the our political uh, actor. So that's why the political actor should be close to the our uh, religious people. And if you see the member of parliament, the member of parliament is if don't if 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 no artist, but mm. uh, the popular uh, people mm. should be businessmen mm. and should be activists and should be uh, uh, apa jagoan itu. Pokoknya yang punya masa mm. <laughs> get uh, so many followers. Okay, next. Uh, and the second projects uh, last year uh, we focus on to deforestation by uh, food estate project uh, drive by Ministry of Environment in the beside room. <laughs> uh, uh, ministry, sorry, Ministry Agriculture uh, and uh, Agrinas. Agrinas is the state company uh, uh, run by Ministry of uh, Defense by Mr. Prabowo. And uh, yeah, tiga menit lagi Pak. Okay, Pak. Uh, uh, that's I mentioned that, uh, before that uh, we should map the actors because the food estate projects in Kalimantan and Sumatra and uh, and Kalimantan, uh, Central Kalimantan and West Kalimantan, it is uh, the uh, make a big picture that the how how the political actor uh, collaboration to destroy the, our forest by the food estate project. Uh, if, we, if we see that uh, election, Mr. Prabowo for the second term, that's again the Mr. Jokowi and uh, Mr. Prabowo uh, again uh, lose the, the, uh, the battle and uh, Mr. Jokowi asked to him to uh, uh, as a ministry of uh, minister of uh, defense, and after that, on the October 2019 and uh, January 2020, Mr. Prabowo established the Agrinas uh, State Company for Agrinas Agricultural National, yeah, Agriculture National, for drive uh, the, uh, the 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 food asset project in Kalimantan. And in April 2020, Mr. Jokowi launched that the the project and uh, Ministry of uh, Environment launched the regulation on food assets only for state body or state organi uh, uh, organizational body, not for private. But Mr. Prabowo established the uh, PT Agrinas as a state uh, companies to drive uh, uh, food asset project in Kalimata. They they cut the forest uh, uh, thirty thousand hectare in Gunung Mas, and uh, that is not uh, not planning because the the regulation uh, launched November twenty twenty, uh, and uh, February twenty twenty one that they get the quick environment assessment. Apa KLH cepat itu pak? So that is not uh, no audit, no 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 planning, and after. Uh, 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 and they plan the cassava, and the cassava is apa uh, tidak hidup apa namanya pak uh, gagal fail to grow, and uh, yeah the, the the forest destroy on the on the gunung mas, uh, uh, the impact is great flooding to impact uh, for village in in uh, near the project. So that's we launched the uh, the October uh, for uh, uh, cover story uh, in English and Indonesian um, uh, version. And the food asset project. This is food asset is uh, important and and we need the the food asset project, but not an extensification. Yeah, maybe this is uh, IPB University get uh, can uh, propose the how how the food asset pro food asset project to feed the growing population, uh, not uh, destroy the forest. And uh, our planning, uh, the government planning, uh, the food asset will help on uh, five area, uh, five, uh, four area: Sumatra, Kalimantan, uh, Nusa Tenggara Timur, and Papua. 
with uh, Netherlands uh, 2.3 million hectare and mostly forest. So that is the threat of deforestation. Uh, back to the back to the uh, our uh, proposal to UN on the NDC. Why, if we want to decrease the emission carbon to keep and to protect the forest, why the plant deforestation and the, why the regulation treat to our forest? Next, yeah, this is the uh, satellite imagery of a uh, food asset project in Kalimantan. You can see that uh, the cassava is not growing, <laughs> and uh, and. Uh, the, the secondary forest is destroyed. Next. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pa Bagja. Unfortunately, IPB University is not involved in food estate. Ah. <laughs> okay, uh, the third speakers, I, I think you, we already met uh, two days ago in uh, our campus. Ibu, <coughs> Ibu Sarah, time is here. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, hopefully, I'll be able. I'm hopefully I'll be able to draw on the two present very interesting presentations. Um, I'm going to talk about the role of communication in building resilience to climate um, in marginalized communities. So uh, next slide, please. Um, communication itself is a driver of rural change. And this can be, there's a role for, by communication, we can think very broadly. We can think media actors, because there is a substantial role. Um, this is, um, my, my colleague's um, talk is a very good example of what that role can be. But then also, um, services that are provided, communication services that are provided to rural communities and to individuals. Uh, um, and one way of thinking about these are rural communication services, so a range of different kinds of activities that are focused on farmers and different kinds of institutional arrangement, arrangements that allow farmers and communities to make more informed decisions and to take collective action. And by institutional arrangements, we, can, we are talking about relationships between, it could be extension, it can be media, it can be community-based media, all the way to national media. It can be individual journalists, um, as well as community practitioners. Um, and the point, the purpose of rural communication services is to focus on relevant content, suitable communication processes, suitable media and ICT applications. Not all media and all ICTs are equal, so we need to think about what are the right ones for the right context. Next slide, please. But when we're wanting to think about this, we need to take a few things into consideration. When you're looking at groups that are marginalized, um, what we have, on the one hand, opportunities like ex the expansion of telecommunications in rural areas. It has grown enormously over time. There has been an expansion of infrastructure, so people are better able to get internet access. They're able to get better access on their mobile phones to greater services. Individual people are also better able to use ICTs. Things like uh, there's a greater diversity of language. Ten years ago, everything was in English, but most of the world doesn't speak English. So that prevents people from effectively using ICTs. It's also possible to use mobile smartphones without being literate. There's more accessibility there. However, there are still huge inequalities in terms of who can access and control communication. So who gets to make the media? Who makes the content? 
who controls it and who gets to use it. Um, there are social and geographic inequalities. So for instance, mountain ranges um, can pose substantial problems. If you don't have the right telecommunication infrastructure, you won't be able to get a mobile signal if you're at the top of a mountain. When we have very different geographies, that can make a huge, that can make a huge difference to who is able to access what. There are rural and urban digital divides. Um, urban areas have far better access. A lot of, we don't always think about rural dwellers and rural communities as needing ICTs. Um, there, we need media diversity in channels and uses of media, and it has diversified. Social media has changed the way we think about media. We have citizen journalism, we have participatory journalism. YouTubers can have a voice. People can create their own voices with different media channels. But there is still a need for traditional media channels, for television and radio and newspapers. And there is a tension where you have the need for strong, transparent, independent journalism and people creating their own content. The idea of fake news and misinformation is how we are able to deal with it now has changed. And finally, we need to also understand that the process of communication can be even more important than the outputs. So these are issues we need to think about. Next slide, please. Um, and these are particularly when dealing with marginalized groups. Um, one way of thinking about this is woo, um, a rural communication services. So you don't need to worry about the details of the framework. It's more to say we can think about a series of approaches and principles that come together with the goal of enhancing the capacity for collective action and informed decision making by rural people. This is an area where communication has a lot to contribute. Next slide, please. Um, and for that to happen, we need several conditions. We need awareness raising and information. So we need to be able to get the right content to the people at the right time. Um, we need knowledge sharing and training. So people need empowerment, they need the right communication capacity, they need appropriate channels. Um, we need advocacy, so there are people-centered policies and it is context-driven, not one-size-fits-all. And we need networking and social mobilization, so inclusivity. Otherwise, we are going to overlook and not include voices who are marginalized and who are otherwise being left out of important conversations. Uh, next slide. So what does this look like in a case? So I'm, I'm gonna tell you a bit about uh, the, commu the case of the communi communication and climate change in Aurora province in the Philippines. This comes from a project that I've been working on for a few years with colleagues in, at ASCOT in the Philippines and the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. So next slide. So one thing to remember, so in the, in the Philippines, I mean, as Indonesia experiences disaster, weather and climate-related disasters regularly, the Philippines particularly gets badly hit by typhoons. And Aurora province is co considered a typhoon alley. It will get hit the first and the most frequently by very strong typhoons. And it is particularly vulnerable to extreme weather events. Indigenous communities rely on fishing and farming and have some of the poorest um, land ownership and resilience conditions, so these typhoons have a, a fairly substantial effect on their livelihoods. And we also know that within the Philippines, it's extraordinarily diverse between indigenous groups as well. So different groups of people experience social inequalities differently, particularly gender and age 
feel the impact of these extreme weather events differently. Next slide. Um, there are a large number of indigenous communities, and the thing to note is partially 110 ethnic and linguistic groups are all considered indigenous people and are governed by the same sets of policies. And it's also a young group. 41% uh, of the, uh, of the um, indigenous people's population in the Philippines is under the age of 14. And then 56% are 15 to 64. If we put this in the context of uh, a, a rural change, young people are leaving agriculture at a high rate in the Philippines. So the agricultural population is largely people who are over 64. Um, and in areas where there are many indigenous peoples, which are watersheds, upland, and mountain ranges, this means you're going up steep mountains into very challenging geography in order to have a livelihood and fishing and farming sectors have the highest poverty rates. That's also the sectors where most indigenous people are seeking a living and, and a livelihood. Next slide. So the snapshot of indigenous peoples is very insecure land ownership. There are land rights legislation, but many communities have not been able to take advantage of it high levels of food insecurity in some communities, low literacy, poor access to education, partially because schools are far away from many communities. So you just, there's, and there isn't a transportation system that like can take children to school on a bus, or even that there is a school within a two hour drive. Um, economic activities are increasingly being threatened, particularly because of deforestation. A lot of the communities that we were visiting relied on forest products, um, and they had legal rights to the forest, particularly things like rattan, but those rights had been eroded. There had been uh, contracts that had been um, for multinational companies that stole land rights or swindled them a bit. Um, because they didn't know what their legal rights were uh, as well as they should have um, or needed to. So the forest and the forest resources are diminishing. And uh, nationally, there's extreme, extreme inequalities, a lot of social marginalization, exploitation, and worsening conditions for indigenous people. Next slide. So these are some of the specific issues that the communities, we were looking at five communities, four of which were heavily reliant on fishing. One was a mixture of some fishing, but also agriculture. Um, so we can see the things that we have been talked about already, um, trees and forest resources, aquatic resources being diminished, um, being either cut down there was a lot of trawling and illegal logging and illegal fishing, even legal fishing and legal uh, logging and forest use was also a, was problematic. Aging population and a lot of people leaving agriculture. Um, next slide. So the groups in question, we, in order to understand how communication can help, we need to understand how their groups are being marginalized. So in this case, there's social marginalization, so there's a tension because there's a lot of people who believe that indigenous people are just stubborn and refuse to change and adapt. There's a tension because, in fact, there are a lot of traditional livelihoods and traditional belief structures that will support resilience and actually support working, using land more lightly. So a lack of understanding of indigenous communities and their beliefs has led to stereotypes and social inequalities. Um, there are different stories, different groups have different stories about land access and control. So there are official stories um, and there's an attention between government and between what the communities want. 
um, and this is widespread. I had been, we've been interviewing one of the chiefs who was very articulate in knowing these are my rights and responsibilities as a Philippine citizen. These are the government's rights and responsibilities. I want a space where I can be, a, I can maintain my rights as a citizen, but I have responsibilities. It was a very clear understanding of what she should have been getting and what she was supposed to be doing as a, as a citizen. But when we, uh, I was talking to people in other parts of the Philippines, um, a couple of people said, well, indigenous people just want all the things they can get, which is exactly in contrast to what actually had been expressed. So there is a lot of tension. Um, and the, mar the livelihoods, there's exploitation by middlemen, um, when, uh, when people are trying to sell their goods um, in market, lack of access to value chains. Um, so there's a physical marginalization, there's social marginalization, there's official, official stories, and then what's going on in communities, and is different levels of support locally. So one mayor had, cre had found land for a group of indigenous people, and others were letting them be exploited. So there's different services. It's not the same between different groups at all. Um, in one community right next to another can have very different uh, services and outcomes. Um, so that's why there's different policies between barangays and different geographies. Uh, next slide. And there's also a lot of resilience built into community belief structures and how people and um, and also in communication patterns and leadership patterns. Communities with strong, strong social networks um, are coming together and taking care of one another, um, but they also need support in order to do that. There are also belief structures about why communities should have enough but not too much. That is, a, it is a cultural belief, and these things support environmental resilience. So, um, what? How does that help us with communication? Next slide. Um, you can we, you know, if we want communication to help effectively from the perspective of empowering and supporting marginalized communities, we need to find the points where communication can have a positive impact. So in this case, we start with preserving and protecting cultural identity. Communication can have a powerful role. It can have a powerful role in education. Um, we know that education spreads within communities. When young people have access to information, it spreads. We, within one of the communities, two of the children had gone to college and everything they learned had been shared with everybody else in the community. So they found out new agricultural practices and we found examples of that all over. Um, so, sorry, I'm taking a long time. Um, uh, if we go to the last slide, to summarize, um, we can build communication strategies when we build on our understanding of how marginalization takes place, what are the dynamics, um, and look at where are there opportunities to support empowerment, to support the development of people's voices and livelihoods, and to build on community assets. So out of the project we were working on, we came up with a communication strategy and it was built on stewardship beliefs, cultural beliefs, technologies that could be used and adapted by the community, um, building individual capacities and using education um, and reinforcing strong community networks. Thank you. Terima kasih, Ibu Sarah. <laughs> okay, uh, from three speakers, I think all of us learn a lot. We see how these three uh, presentation is connected each other. You see how uh, 
all of us are marginalized, I think, <laughs> because of the deforestation, because uh, this is really make, have a big contribution to the climate crisis. crisis. So all of us are marginalized because of this. And communication uh, play a very important role as a journalist, as a scientist, as a researcher, uh, should work together, build a network and uh, collaboration. Not to overcome, but to at least to make people aware about, about this, this, uh, these issues. Uh, I don't want to uh, make this uh, longer. Uh, we still have time to discuss. I know that uh, around uh, 60 people are in Zoom. Uh, so they they also can contribute uh, to the discussion. And of course, all of us in this room can contribute in question and answer session. So please, if you have any comment, uh, question, clarification, please uh, raise your hand and let me see you. <laughs> so you will be seen. <laughs> Okay, uh, I saw one hand over there, and then who else? I cannot see the screen, but if you have, just raise your hand in the screen also, uh, and uh, the committee will tell me if anybody uh, raise hand in the Zoom room. Okay, uh, please, you... Uh, Committee, please, uh, microphone. Okay. Where I want to ask a question specifically is to the presenter talking about the risk of deforestation. And I want to channel my question directly to the case of Indonesia. I still believe that Indonesia has its economy based on agriculture. And by 2022, Indonesia has a population of about 273 million, if I'm right. So trying to enforce against deforestation, I want to talk from agricultural perspective now. You're talking up from the perspective of, of a, a journalist. Have you tried to make researches to find out how your population will suffer if you go against deforestation? Because I still believe that for you to produce enough for your population, you will deforest in order to produce. But when you are guiding against deforestation, are you not proposing other measures to produce for your population? How do you intend to achieve your purpose? Any, jadi pertanyaannya itu apa namanya? Balancing about deforestation and food production. Okay, any other comment? or clarification? None? Okay, uh, silakan Pak Bagja. Okay. Uh, thank you. This is the very interesting question because so many people ask to us why the tempo ag again so many regulation mm -hmm. <laughs> on the food estate, on the environment, on the uh, forest concession and so on. Uh, the answer is we should balancing the how we treat to the, our forest and protect them. Mm. Because this is the development. Indonesia is still a developed uh, country, so we still we need to grow in the economy. But in Indonesian case, on the development should be related to state capture corruption. Mm. Okay. Cap corruption by the regulation. Mm. So that is not equal to our all player on the development. For example, in the Papua, on the deforestation by planned deforestation, deforestation by regulation, deforestation by the law, mm. because the company gets the license to cut the trees. Mm. Because the violation on the operation, mm the companies treat indigenous people in there. In Papua, all the land is traditional forest, right? 
So if you cut the trees on the their concession, it is the overlapping with the traditional forest land. There is indigenous people live there. So if the for, uh, uh, forest um, companies have uh, license to cut the trees, should be engaged to with the indigenous people to get uh, to operate together and engage them to get how to protect uh, their forest and get benefit with the indigenous people. Now, what we found in the Papua, the companies only cut the trees and about mengabaikan pak, and not uh, care with the indigenous people. If outside the concession, we call it land grabbing. But because the inside the uh, concession, there is there is uh, there is regulated legal legal. <laughs> so when when the companies go to the court, should be indigenous people will lose. That is not equality, right? So if the question is how we balancing the the protected forest and exploit the forest uh, on the development program should be balancing with the community, with the economy, and the ecology. Our regulation states that if you cut the forest, you should be plant the trees in the other area, right? That's why the government and the, our law has uh, dana reboisasi, mm. rainforest, eh, sorry, uh, reforestation fund for the rehabilitation forest that destroy in Papua. We should uh, rehabilitation on reforestation in Kalimantan and Sumatra and so on. But we don't know how the rehabilitation program. Mm. For example, last year, the deforestation numbers is 100, 115,000 hectares. The deforestation annual. How many hectares for uh, rehabilitation? Only 3,000 3, hectares. So that is mismatch. That is the problem. If we get so much money from the uh, rep uh, uh, reforestation fund, our government should be rehabilitate the forest on Papua, on Kalimantan, and the, and the Sumatra. So, if you cut the trees and destroy the forest, we should, eh, we, we, we have, uh, apa, pengganti, pak? Displacement. Exchange the forest in the other area. So, if we propose to UN on the COP, we want to decrease the carbon emission with the increasing the absorbing with the forest. We still cut the, uh, we still, we, we still uh, cut the forest, but we still absorb the emission. That release from the desert forest. Oke, okay, uh, thank you Pak Bagja. Semoga menjelaskan. Uh, yeah, I think it's clear. Uh, it's not only this not only about uh, forest and food, but the corruption is there. Oke, okay, any other uh, comment? Uh, ibu, 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 Grenti, please. Hello, uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, to Pak Bagja and also Carol, uh, and it's, I think uh, what you shared about the deforestation is very heartbreaking for the citizen of in the Southeast Asia. Um, so I was wondering if you also know uh, whether a market-based solution such as like a carbon offsetting is happening in 
uh, in the areas of the, the food estates, for example, like in central Kalimantan and Sumatra, and probably also in Philippines, whether the indigenous peoples uh, are being compensated by the corporates that are having operations there, whether they are having the payment for ecosystem, ecosystem schemes, for example, the PES, or uh, we also have the Red Plus, for example. Um, so yeah, if, if there are any market-based solution like the, the carbon offsetting is happening, because obviously regulation um, has its, its own role, but probably the market has also the role to help out the deforestation, to decrease the deforestation rate. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bu Grenti. First, I, I will uh, ask Ibu Carol Ilagan to answer the Ibu Grenti. Please. Hi, everyone. Um, hi, Grenti. Uh, for the Philippines, actually, it hasn't really, uh, like, uh, the carbon market, um, hasn't really kind of um, reached the Philippines. I am familiar with um, one case in the southern part of the Philippines in Mindanao, but only involving um, uh, one company and uh, an indigenous group there. But that is the only case that I am aware of. So um, maybe unlike um, other countries, the Philippines is still um, lagging behind in terms of participating in the the carbon offset, the carbon um, market. But I am quite aware that I know there are some um, uh, negative reports uh, also in terms of um, how this is um, being in implemented. So I'd be curious to, to find out um, what happens specifically for the Philippines if, you know, it becomes um, uh, more uh, widespread in, in, in other areas of across the country. Thank you. Okay. Uh, salamat po. Uh, Pak Bagja? Okay. Uh, thank you, Bu Grenti, for a question. That is an uh, interesting uh, question because uh, now we are uh, still struggling to develop the regulation on the carbon market and carbon trading. Mm. Uh, last year, the, our president, Mr. Joko Widodo, launched the uh, Peraturan President, uh, President Regulation, Hmm. Number 19.8 uh, for the title is Nilai Ekonomi Carbon, hmm. uh, Carbon Economic, economic Value. Uh, value yeah. hmm. And then now Ministry of Environment still struggling to develop the, the regulation to uh, engage hmm. the uh, carbon trading. And for my uh, personal view that carbon trading is the good way to balancing hmm. the, uh, the how we protect uh, the, the the environment to get uh, benefit and gain the economic value from them, from there. I mean, from the protecting the forest, the protecting forest, yes, the sea, yes. and so on. Mm. Uh, mangrove, gambu, uh, wetland, mm. and uh, pitland, pitland, and so on. Mm. Because uh, if uh, the carbon market increasing and the, the the pricing is more than the 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 wood or forest mm. product, mm. I think that is why not if we protect the forest, not mm. cutting the, 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 the trees, and just protect it, and we get the benefit mm. from from the forest. But this is the, the struggling because uh, 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 last 10 years, our government makes uh, 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 an uh, uh, MOU, Memorandum of, of understanding with the Norway government on the Red Plus uh, project, mm. but uh, uh, last year the government cut the MOU. Mm. We don't know and we don't have any information why uh, uh, what happened on the on the collaboration mm -hmm. because the government uh, cannot uh, don't want explain the 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 how how the the brick of collaboration. That is the good example, I think, how the government and G2G make a cooperation on the Red Plus uh, projects uh, and exchange with the uh, pricing of the carbon trading. And now, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, uh, our government launched the multi-business uh, forest 
multi business on the forest. So the carbon trading is one of fourteen uh, kind of business on the uh, concession. So HPH uh, uh, timber companies uh, not only uh, base uh, the product to the wood, but can uh, trade the carbon absorbing on their concession. That is interesting. Uh, after we launched the uh, job creation uh, law uh, last two years, and then Ministry of Environment uh, launched the multi-business uh, forest on the concession. Uh, uh, so that's uh, the open the uh, carbon trading accept on the land concession and the forest concession. That is interesting uh, develop, development. And yeah, if uh, apa namanya, this is mulus apa, uh, okay for for development program. Mm. I think this is the future of business on the forest in Indonesia. Okay. Because we still have the old forest, we still have uh, 145 million hectares tropical forest, but uh, more than 30 uh, million hectares deforested, and we have so many uh, uh, conservation forests, uh, protected forests, and uh, we 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 have uh, uh, peatland and mangrove. Mm. It is uh, the the highest uh, uh, store carbon, yeah. Mm, yeah. So, but the treat is uh, the the treatment of the mangrove is still on the APL area penggunaan lain itu uh, uh, outside the kawasan hutan, mm, outside the <laughs> the forest, uh, state forest. Uh, forest. Yeah. And in the APL, the because we are autonomy uh, regulation, mm. this is uh, local, under local local government government. Mm. And with the local government, uh, the local government should have the apa, uh, apa namanya uh, local local law apa namanya pendapatan. Mm. So there is the trait is will change the mangrove forest to the maybe uh, pertambakan jalan and so on. Yeah. So if back again to the carbon trading, if carbon trading has a market table for domestic market in Indonesia, I think this is interesting to uh, apa, to avoid the government destroy the forest mm. and just protect it and get benefit from them. Okay. Thank you. Pak. Okay, thank you. Bu Sarah, do you have uh, any opinion about how to compensate the deforestation to, to the marginalized people? Well, I think it has to be careful. So, for instance, if you're trading mangrove for another type, yeah. mangrove is used by fishing communities. Mm. And so where there have been, where communities are moved for environmental change purposes, that often doesn't work very well. So if you change an area so that you cannot have a livelihood there anymore, um, that tends to, and, and communities are displaced. Um, other examples from other parts of the world have told us that people will resist moving to a new place because there are strong cultural and historical roots with geography. Um, mangrove, I mean, I think I'm thinking about mangroves in particular because remove that we have ecological systems that. Um, are going to be disrupted. So if we start taking, making changes in a way that's just, yes, if you have a piece of land that can be reclaimed and repurposed for with trees, whereas the land may not be suitable for other purposes, that's fantastic. Um, and there are some, some, uh, some research has already been done in Indonesia to show, okay, here we could actually reclaim this marginalized land and that could become a really good opportunity for instance for trees um, and reforestation that could then lead to carbon trading but some places we need to be careful and it's in the regul the regulation and cutting down on corruption on legal legal um, logging and trading um, 
because the ecosystems are systems and you change part of one and you can destroy the whole thing and you have to be extraordinarily careful even turning lights on at the wrong time of day affecting insect activity um, cutting down mangroves can then have a ripple effect across fish, across water nutrition, and then can affect a fishing system. So it's more, it has any kind of um, commodification of forests, and I'm not against that. There's some fascinating red programs that have had tremendous benefit for people. Partially it's who are the people that are going to benefit? And I think you put it very well when talking about the trade-off. We have to think about economy, equality, and ecology. Um, equality often falls off the, the map. So, but those three have to be taken into consideration because the ec ecological impacts could then make equality in, negative in, inequalities worse. So it's about balancing it and trying to understand work. And this is where science and um, policy has to work together and communicate well and clearly, which isn't easy because it is often two slightly different languages. OK. Unfortunately, time is up. I hope all of us have uh, choose something nice this up, this uh, morning, and I think it's not enough to 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 chew about it in 75 minutes. <laughs> the whole days we we can use it, we can use that food and chew it, and I think all the three presenters have uh, give us a very rich knowledge about. Not only the de deforestation is not far away in Kalimantan, but deforestation has its impact to us today in this room. That's the, the main point, I think. The food, the deforestation, the nickel, the Tesla and everything have its own impact to us. And we should aware about that and we should overcome it by working together. The scientists, the journalists, the politicians, uh, all should work together, hand in hand, collaborate and make. It's not only about economic, it's not about only uh, culture, but the whole system of our life is affected by these things. I think this on the only, uh, what's that? It's not a conclusion, but I, what I have uh, the, this morning. Because I know that all of you have concluded uh, by your by yourself what what we we talk this morning uh thank you busara thank you pak bagja and uh thank you ibu carol and thank you. i think let us give big applause for all of us because we have already a very fruitful uh discussion this morning thank you very much uh good morning thank you very much for Dr. Juara Lubis as our moderator for today, and also thank you for Miss Sarah, Mr. Bagja, and also Miss Carol. Thank you, everyone. Okay, for the moderator and presenters, you can join us downstairs because we're gonna. Because after this, we are going to give the moderator and also the presenters a placard. Yes, yes. please. And we would like to invite Ms. Granti Paramita from Pulitzer Center to give a certificate and placard for the moderator and presenter for this session. The first one is for Dr. Juara Lubis as our moderator. The second one is for Miss Sarah as our presenter. The third one is for Mr. Bagja as our presenter.
And for Miss Carol, the certificate and also the placard will be sent directly to you. Thank you very much. Okay, now before we continue our agenda, let's take a picture together. So we would like you to invite Professor Arya Ahdidarmawan as the head of the Department of Communication and Community Development to step on the stage together. Okay. Okay, count on three. One, two, three. Cheers. Okay. All right. Once again, thank you so much. For Dr. Juara Lubis as our moderator, and also thank you to all the speakers who presented very well about communication for development and social justice. Okay, after we listen to an insightful discussion, we are going to have a five minutes break while watching an amazing performance from an IPB University student. So please welcome to the stage, Diana Sri Furoida. Farmers, your faith is such an irony. Rotten by Dian Aswi Freida. Oh, farmers, your faith is such an irony. Do all you people know a grain of rice that you eat? How hard does it take? For it to be processed, starting from preparing the field seed and water. The farmers that you people often ignore. I'm sure there's no one here who wants to be a farmer. Am I right? But let us take a closer look. Farmers with their darkness and dry sky. Stung by the sun most of their time. Let's look at their small features. The penny that they play to fit everyone else. Still, it's so ironic that many farmers are struggling to feed their own families. Yes, there's a fine line between an entrepreneurship or businessman and a farmer like a king with his servants so ironic is it not have it ever crossed your mind the remaining strong of farmers your faith is such an irony for the sake of the nation's food stability. Yet another unsung heroes living in this nation. And it means you, dear farmers. Thank you very much for Dian Aspi Furoida for your performance today. What an amazing performance, right, Arlen? Amazing. Okay. Um, now we're going to have our second plenary session. Uh, that's going to talk about community-based reforestation and social forest that will be presented by our inspiring speaker, Professor Kosuke Mizuno from University of Indonesia, Ms. Titi Kartitiani from NetGeo Indo, and Mr. Dana Kencana from IDN Times. And in this session, the presentation and discussion will be guided by our moderator, Dr. Suryo Adi Wibowo. 
Now please welcome to the stage our moderator and presenter for this plenary session. All right, to Dr. Suryo Adiwebowo, the time is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, students, professor, senior lecturer, also our student from UK. Hope you in a good health and mood this uh, morning session. Uh, today, I will share the session, which is, I think, all of you particularly in IPB uh, already knows <laughs> Professor Mizuno, long-term colleague of IPB University, and uh, the other uh, presenter, that would like to address their thinking, their observation, Mbak uh, Titi Karti Tiani, right? And also uh, Mas Dana Kencana. Mas is a, a brother in Japanese language. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this event discusses the reports and research about community-based restoration and communication for social justice through investigative report. I think this is a niche that quite interesting linking social justice, investigative report, and environmental or forest restoration. So Regarding forest, we already know, I think, that forest is does not only consist of timber or tree stands and wildlife. Forest also a social construction where values, norms, politics, and culture co-evolve with nature. Then. Furthermore, forest is also a politicized environment where deforestation, reforestation, wildlife conservation, as well as agrarian change struggle to secure their interests. So, uh, we, this morning, we have three prominent persons to address their thinking, the first, Professor Kosuke Mizuno. He will address about agrarian change and people's welfare, a comparative perspective between Sumatra and Java, Indonesia. The second, Ibu Titi Kartitiani from Rainforest Journalism Van Granti, reforestation 
with local plans by Tengger tribe or Tengger community in Ranupani. And the last, Mas Dana Kencana from uh, IDN Times Rainforest Journalism Fund Granty also one word mutualism. It's interesting. So I will uh, ask each presenter to address 15 minutes. So we have time to for discussion and debates. And I would like to invite Professor Misuno to address uh, your okay. thinking and uh, observation. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bowo. I'm so happy to uh, present here uh, because <clears throat> uh, I can uh, present in front of many my old friends at uh, Bowo Arichara University. <clears throat> Today, I want to uh, talk about the agrarian change uh, in Indonesia, uh, comparative perspective from uh, Java and Sumatra, and uh, uh, somewhat uh, discuss on the uh, forestation or deforestation and uh, uh, effect to restore the uh, forest. Uh, <clears throat> uh, next. On the uh, agrarian change, of course, we have a discussion on the uh, agricultural evolution uh, by the Kurifot and there, there are many critics uh, to them. And uh, uh, already we, we have, have known that there is uh, agrarian transformation in uh, rural Java. That, is, that was proved by many uh, researchers. Uh, but uh, how about uh, outer, in, outer Indonesia or Sumatra or Kalimantan? That is a big question. And the uh, discussion of uh, agricultural, uh, agricultural uh, relation, agrarian relation is always related to the uh, capitalistic development of agriculture or land landlordism or uh, pro uh, Proletarianization. Uh, uh, the, so those topic also I want to discuss um, today. Uh, next, uh, this is a, a result of research so far. Uh, we see that the, um, uh, in, in, in Indonesia uh, many of farmer have small amount, small area of uh, agricultural land. And uh, but we we find uh, differentiation. Next, please. And this is a study of uh, our <coughs> uh, respect uh, respectful uh, 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 teacher, uh, <coughs> uh, Professor Wiradi, and uh, and uh, Padianto. Uh, this is a uh, study on the. Uh, smallholder farmer and uh, land holding uh, status the owner uh, operator is dominant and next uh, but uh, we, we know that the, in Indonesia there are vast area of uh, state forest Kaosan Utan so uh, discussion on the uh, uh, agrarian uh, transformation Somewhat concentrated to the uh, area owned by uh, local people or out, outside the uh, uh, Kawasan Utan or state forest. On the other hand, there are vast state forests. So, how do we integrate the uh, uh, state forest or issue of customary law and so on? Uh, next, please. Uh, this is our research site. So I today I show uh, our research product. Uh, 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 research is conducted at the Central Java Chamar area, and the, the second uh, area is Riau uh, province. Uh, this is the uh, product of Chomar uh, project, uh, so called, uh, and uh, Central Java and. Uh, uh, yellow, pa yellow uh, party's research village. 
uh, uh, next please. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, this study uh, is relating to the uh, research, uh, uh, research result uh, conducted in 1903 uh, uh, to 05 by the uh, Sugar Syndicate of Netherlands uh, Indy. And uh, we have conducted research in 1998, and also we have conducted 2012. So we can find that. Uh, uh, landless people have found at the beginning of the 20th century 31%. Uh, but uh, the uh, landless increased uh, 1990 uh, 56%. And uh, 2012, we find the data uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, fantastic or surprising uh, data, 85.9% of household are landless. Uh, but uh, uh, those uh, uh, landless people uh, live uh, no, uh, usually in the non-agriculture sector, uh, usually in the informal non-agriculture sector, uh, as well as the agricultural uh, laborer. And the land size, uh, Average land size, including the land, landless, was 0 0.7272 at, uh, nine, at the, at the uh, beginning of 20th century, 1990 to 1990, uh, 0 0.18, and 12, 20, uh, 12 uh, only 0 0.06 uh, hectare. So population increase, and uh, uh, Many of people become the landless. On, on the other hand, uh, landlord, uh, landlord uh, is not fine. Maybe uh, uh, people who have uh, land two pass, two hectare more, but they uh, accumulate twenty eight percent. That that uh, can be said that uh, uh, phenomena is uh, agrarian uh, differentiation. <clears throat> Next. On the other hand, how about the uh, welfare of people, uh, income level? So uh, average uh, income uh, among the uh, 10,000, uh, well, 10, yeah, sorry, 1,000 household at the Chomar area was 18 uh, uh, million rupiah, or uh, 18 juta rupiah uh, one, one year. Uh, on the other hand, uh, poverty line <coughs> uh, measured according to the Sayogyo concept uh, was 2.9 uh, juta uh, or 2.9 million uh, rupiah per person per year. So uh, 18 uh, million rupiah is somewhat uh, uh, more than the poverty line, we can say. One person is two. To find same, so one uh, household is, uh, yeah, yeah. But we, we find that uh, uh, less than uh, le, uh, less than five million, uh, there are uh, strata that uh, can be said uh, poor uh, the, because uh, we, we see that, uh, only 2.8 uh, million rupiah for a household. Next, please. Now, this is uh, only this is for thousand. Households, uh, we can uh, we can say the same thing. Next, please. Next. Uh, now, now, this is this shows that uh, uh, other sector also uh, have some some similar income level, and uh, many of uh, many of uh, people are engaged in the uh, informal uh, uh, informal sector occupation. And next, please. Yeah, yeah, this is, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, next please. Yeah, now at, at the area, we find the uh, phenomena, phenomena, phenomena of afforestation or forestation or reforestation. Now, many of people plant the tree at the, their own private land, not, not the uh, state forest. So the uh, area of 
uh, many people uh, plant the tree uh, around the slope of the uh, mountain rather than uh, uh, cultivating the terrace uh, agriculture. Next, please. Uh, next, uh, this is a, a, a location in Rio, uh, uh, the, the peatland area. Uh, next, please. Now, this is the, our research site. Uh, next, please. So, uh, at Rio, the uh, situation is quite different. Uh, peop, uh, household uh, hold around 25, 25 hectares more are found, and the uh, landless is quite small. Uh, next, please. Now, income level, uh, income level is, is uh, somewhat surprisingly similar to Java. Average is 29 uh, million rupiah or 20, uh, 29 juta rupiah. On the other hand, in Java, as we have seen, 20, uh, uh, 22 or 20, 2018 or 20, uh, 20, 22 uh, million. So in, uh, in Sumatra, 29 uh, uh, million rupiah. So, so, so far different. Uh, here in, in Sumatra, we find many uh, oil palm and rubber. Uh, so there are some dynamic uh, development of agriculture. Somewhat on the other hand, uh, the uh, degradation of peatland are fine. And uh, peatland fire uh, uh, appear. So those development are accompanied with uh, environmental declaration, but anyway, income level is increasing. And, uh, and uh, uh, some, some people are still uh, below, below the poverty line. And upper level people uh, have the 54 uh, million rupiah. On the other hand, in Java, uh, 178 uh, million rupiah uh, per year. So, uh, differentiation far, far larger in Java uh, in, than in Sumatra. Uh, that is our finding. Next, please. Uh, so, what is a uh, uh, capitalistic agriculture? Capitalistic agriculture is found at the, at the oil palm uh, company invest huge money in the oil palm. Hatei Akashia uh, Akash Crash Parpa uh, is planted uh, for the paper and pulp, pulp industry. So uh, co from colonial time, uh, government reserve vast area as a state, uh, state land, uh, state forest. That is, uh, that is directed to the uh, private company, they invest and develop the uh, capitalistic agriculture. We cannot find that easily, it's not, it's not difficult to find the capitalist agriculture at the uh, people's, uh, people's um, uh, agriculture, uh, but we find uh, capital agriculture uh, in, in this area, in that uh, place. Uh, next, uh, this is a uh, condition at the Kawasan Utan in uh, Sumatra, uh, at the Riau. Uh, we f can we find Jirara Mumbakar Utan? Uh, refrain from uh, uh, set fire at the forest. But how where we can find the forest? Uh, this is a uh, result of degradation of peatland. The, so peatland uh, is, uh, is uh, exploited. Company invest uh, huge money for the acacia plantation that uh, trigger the uh, peatland fire and the people, uh, uh, people clear, the land, clear the land for their own uh, land use. And uh, the large scale uh, Peteran, large scale uh, Peteran fire and the degradation take place. Uh, so, uh, for, uh, so we find that the deforestation, at, uh, serious deforestation at the Peteran area so government uh, introduced the social forestry program. Social forestry program can be, uh, can be implemented at the, co uh, the uh, area where we find the conflict, uh, land, 
agrarian conflict because the people make the uh, settlement on the uh, state forest, but the state forest is uh, state forest is uh, 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 given to the uh, company as a uh, concession, Harte concession. So multiple multiple uh, <laughs> land right uh, are fined. Uh, people's cust people's customary law in the state forest and the companies had had e so there is conflict so at the conflict area uh, social forestry uh, can be introduced and the people are people are <coughs> willing to implement the uh, social forestry program so uh, we can see the quite uh, next please so we can see the quite different perspective between Java and mm. uh, outer uh, Indonesia or Sumatra. Uh, in Java, uh, people uh, serious de-agrarization, uh, but uh, non, uh, non agriculture sector, informal sector support the livelihood and their dynamism of uh, local economy. Uh, on the other hand, and we find that a forest, uh, you find the forestation because the uh, uh, increase of livelihood of people uh, change the attitude of people. Rather than planting the cassava at the hill, uh, they plant the uh, tree such as sengon. Uh, that is uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, labor saving uh, planting. People plant and uh, no work more. Uh, on the other hand, in outer Java, outer Indonesia, outer Indonesia uh, we find the dynamic, uh, dynamic development of uh, oil palm and also dynamic oil palm by farmer, by smallholder and the, the company. But that, accomp that uh, accompanies the uh, serious deforestation and the environmental degradation, but uh, many, uh, many efforts can be uh, conducted now, one of them is a social policy program by the government for the disputed uh, uh, state uh, forest area. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Precisely 15 minutes, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Ibu, Ma, please. <laughs> Tes, tes. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, terima kasih. Thank you, Pak Bowo, uh, for the time. I will presenting about our reforestation with local plants by Tengger tribe in Ranuhani village. But uh, I uh, presenting with in Bahasa Indonesia. <laughs> yeah. uh, terima kasih sebelumnya. Uh, di sini saya ingin menyampaikan hal-hal yang sedikit menggembirakan setelah tadi kita melihat uh, presentasi di sesi pertama terutama tadi dari Mas Bagja yang <laughs> sepertinya tak ada harapan lagi gitu Mas <laughs> uh, kebetulan uh, yang akan saya presentasikan itu uh, proyek RCF saya yang pertama uh, yang kedua uh, dua bulan lalu kami ke Papua uh, dan ternyata yang di launching hari ini bahwa kerjasama peliputan antara jurnalis dengan saintis eh, pas proyek di Papua itu saya kebetulan melakukan saya jalan sama eh, Mas Yuda ini ada orangnya dia peneliti anggrek eh, pada saat di situ sebenarnya sebagai fotografer dan kameramen cuman ketika kami jalan bareng eh, saya berharap menemukan eh, hal yang luput di saya gitu dan akhirnya di sana memang dalam kurang lebih 200 meter persegi hutan Papua, kita menemukan keragaman anggrek yang luar biasa. 200 meter persegi saja, Pak. Dalam sehari kita eksplor di situ dan menemukan keragaman karena yang kita lihat anggrek dan beberapa new species yang sedang diidentifikasikan. Artinya ketika tadi presenting by Mas Bagja dengan penebangan hutan yang sekian ribu, itu bisa dibayangkan betapa kehilangan kita itu banyak sekali. 
itu sih uh, mungkin menjadi awareness dari Bapak Ibu yang hadir di sini dan juga uh, di seluruh dunia tentang keberadaan hutan Papua. Nah, uh, selanjutnya saya ingin uh, merepres uh, mempresentasikan uh, proyek RGF yang pertama. Ada dua hal yang menarik uh, yang membuat saya liputan ke sana, uh, yaitu di sini adalah uh, masyarakat next. Pertama adalah masyarakat Tengger, itu indigenous people. Kemudian uh, yang kedua, bagaimana sistem uh, reforestasi itu menggunakan tanaman lokal dan uh, tidak homogen. Jadi tanamannya beragam. Uh, pertama, saya ingin me menyampaikan bagaimana uh, landscape lokasi liputannya di Taman Nasional Bromo Tengger Semeru. Itu terletak di Jawa Timur, di empat kabupaten. Luasnya kira-kira 50 ribu hektar dan terletak zona ketinggian rehabilitasi itu di desa Ranupane itu di atas 2000 meter persegi. Jadi 2200 meter dari permukaan laut. Di sana tipe hutannya adalah submontana, montana dan subalpin. Jadi memang hutan di ketinggian. Next. Uh, Ancaman yang paling besar dari keberadaan hutan di Ranupani adalah pertama adalah e, kebakaran hutan. Dan ini banyak faktor. Yang pertama tentang e, di sana kan ada gunung Merapi Semeru yang sangat aktif yang kemarin juga meletus yang lumayan lumayan besar. Yang kedua adalah faktor manusia. Nah, ketika kami e, mendapatkan beberapa e, fakta tentang Faktor manusia ini agak sulit untuk menulis karena kalau Mas Bagja bisa menulis karena yang dilawan adalah pemerintah. Ketika saya menulis ini ada konflik dalam enklave di Desa Ranupani. Jadi misalnya saya menulis penyebabnya A itu nanti akan kontraproduktif terhadap penghijauan itu sendiri gitu. Makanya akhirnya setelah tidak yakin ya kami keep data itu gitu. Jadi penyebab Kebakaran hutan sesungguhnya tidak hanya faktor alam, tetapi banyak faktor manusia yang agak sulit untuk diungkap sebetulnya. Itu. Terus yang kedua illegal logging, tetap. Yang ketiga adalah spesies invasif. Itu menjadi isu yang penting. Yang pertama, salah satunya yang menutup Danau Ranupane dengan Salvinia molesta, dan yang kedua ini dengan tumbuhan lain semacam ganggang yang beneran menghilangkan hutan, menghilangkan kawasan perairan di Danau Ranupane. Ini foto kebakaran hutan terbesar terjadi pada 2019 itu menghanguskan 131 hektar itu termasuk terluas yang selama lima tahun terakhir. Next, nah ini profil dari desa Ranupane. Ranupane merupakan desa enclave yang terletak di dalam taman nasional. Luasnya adalah sekitar 8,3 km persegi dihuni oleh seribu 500-an jiwa suku Tengger terletak di ketinggian 2.200 meter persegi. Di sana adat masih sangat kuat mendominasi dalam kehidupan sehari-hari. Ini salah satu beberapa upacara termasuk ojung yang apa ya perkelahian sampai mengeluarkan darah itu setiap tahun masih dilaksanakan di desa Ranupani. Lanjut. Nah ini yang akan saya sampaikan yaitu tentang Restorasi ekosistem yang dilakukan oleh uh, sekelompok orang di Tengger yang sampai sekarang masih dilakukan secara swadaya. Jadi uh, prinsipnya ada tiga hal yaitu yang pertama membangun uh, community base. Jadi masyarakatnya dulu yang dalam tanda petik disadarkan untuk penghijauan. Uh, yang kedua adalah menggunakan tanaman lokal dari spesies yang ada jadi mengumpulkan benih dari hutan di sekitar baru kemudian ditanam. Dan tantangan yang ketiga adalah karena terletak di ketinggian 2000 itu frost atau embun beku yang e, kerap menghancurkan tanaman e, yang ditanam. Itu next. Ini e, hal yang menarik ketika masyarakat Tengger itu dengan sendirinya menanam dengan kesadaran sendiri. Nah ternyata prosesnya tidak tidak instan. Yang pertama memang e, ada seorang istilahnya inisiator yang masuk dengan NGO pada saat itu yaitu dengan programnya Jaika pertama memang me membayar 90 orang untuk menanam proyeknya sekitar 1156 hektar dari sekitar 2000 
uh, 2000 hektar yang harus di recovery di uh, kawasan TNBTS. Nah, kemudian uh, dari program ini tahun 2010 dimulai, kemudian dilanjutkan 2015 dan berhenti 2020. Nah yang menarik adalah setelah tahun 2020 itu masyarakat tetap berinisiatif menanami sendiri. Nah kesadaran ini yang saya highlight bahwa masih ada harapan selain penggundulan hutan yang dilakukan oleh on the car of government ya, pemerintah yang korup. Uh, apa yang menjadi kunci dari ini semua ternyata, uh, next, ini. Jadi kom- komunikasi, ada satu tokoh di sana namanya uh, Mas Andi, Andi Yulkarnain. Dia sebetulnya koordinator Jaika, tetapi setelah dia masuk ke Ranupani dan tidak keluar lagi. Karena dia jatuh cinta dengan tempat itu, meskipun proyeknya selesai, dia tetap tinggal bersama masyarakat Ranupani dengan segala konflik yang ada di dalamnya. Karena melihat masyarakat lokal, indigenous people itu tidak tidak polos gitu ya, selalu ada kepentingan yang kita sebenarnya pusing sendiri melihat itu semua. Nah. komunikasi yang paling aktif ternyata bukan di forum resmi tetapi di dapur. Jadi inilah dapur Anupane yang menjadi sarana komunikasi pendekatan ke masyarakat untuk menyadarkan tentang pentingnya hutan. Itu jadi uh, dilakukan di dapur. Next. Ini uh, konsep dari tadi ekosistem uh, restorasi ekosistem yang ada di Ranupane ya, yaitu yang pertama adalah tadi memilih tanaman pionir, kemudian baru nanti tumbuh tanaman subklimak yaitu uh, untuk suksesi yang selanjutnya akan menjadi tanaman klimak yaitu tanaman berkayu. Yang pertama dipilih adalah tanaman yang cepat tumbuh, cepat mengcover uh, permukaan tanah yang gundul sehingga nanti akan menciptakan iklim mikro sehingga memberi peluang kepada tanaman berkayu untuk tumbuh dengan sendirinya. Jadi konsepnya seperti itu. Selama ini sebelumnya penanaman dilakukan dengan satu tanaman yaitu cemara karena berpikir bahwa di sana di ketinggian sekian itu yang hidup cemara saja padahal enggak gitu. Nah tantangannya di sini ternyata pada saat tahun 2010 program dimulai butuh dua tahun untuk mendata ragam tanaman itu dan bagaimana mengecambahkan. Indonesia ternyata tidak punya data pohon rimba. Bagaimana membudidayakan pohon rimba itu tidak ada data. Mungkin ini tantangan bagi para peneliti untuk untuk uh, mendata bagaimana mengembangbiakan pohon rimba. Next. Seperti ini, uh, setelah uh, pohon rimba itu tumbuh bagus, ternyata ada tantangannya yaitu membuku. Nah ini bagaimana cara mengatasinya, uh, ada apa fans tenis di Flora of Jawa kan pernah dengan disungkup ternyata tidak efektif dan ternyata yang paling efektif justru seperti masyarakat lokal menanam kentang yaitu ketika embun buku menyerang tanaman pagi-pagi sudah disiram disirami dan itu nanti akhirnya jadi jadi bagus jadi tidak mati next ini uh, stepnya yaitu pertama adalah masyarakat lokal diajak untuk mengenali jenis-jenis pohon yang ada di hutan dan kemudian mengumpulkan uh, benihnya Ini salah satu yang sukses yaitu Dodonia viscosa atau nama lokalnya kesek itu menjadi tumbuhan pionir yang cepat tumbuh dan cepat dibiakkan. Next. Nah ini uh, yang tadi saya sebut bahwa belum ada data bagaimana mengecambahkan aneka jenis pohon rimba. Jadi dari uh, sekitar 30 yang terdata, 30 spesies yang terdata, hanya 11 yang berhasil dibiakkan dan tumbuh lainnya tidak tahu cara membiakannya bagaimana gitu dan itu tidak efektif itu lanjut nah ini hasil dari uh, pendataan sebelah jenis pohon rimba tadi yang sukses ditanam sukses berkecambah dan bisa tumbuh dengan bagus jadi uh, di TNBTS pada saat proyek ini diinventarisasi ada 39 jenis pohon kemudian 21 diantaranya berhasil dikecambahkan jadi sisanya tidak berhasil dikecambahkan karena mungkin ya tidak tahu caranya sudah dibakar kemudian disangrai dipendam dengan berbagai posisi pun tidak tumbuh ada yang seperti itu nah ada sebelah jenis ini yang uh, kemudian bisa tumbuh dan uh, uh, menjadi tanaman untuk suksesi atau reforestasi reforestasi next ini uh, setelah ke, uh, program itu selesai ternyata masyarakat kemudian punya 
apa ya inisiatif untuk menanam sendiri ada sekitar mungkin tidak banyak hanya lima orang yang masih uh, setiap minggu menanam dan itu biasanya dilakukan pada musim hujan mereka kemudian mengajak anak-anak uh, pondok pesantren kemudian anak sekolah untuk uh, membantu menanam dan tanamannya ini berasal dari uh, pembibitan masyarakat sendiri yang kemudian dijual dan dibeli oleh TN jadi itu men- mendatangkan uh, income yang yang uh, menarik lanjut Nah, ada hal yang perlu di highlight tentang kebijakan pusat yang eh, menyebabkan dampak di Ranupane. Foto yang Bapak Ibu lihat di sini adalah efek dari para pendaki. Sampah yang dihasilkan eh, para pendaki di Semeru itu minimal 500 pendaki per hari. Kalau kita hitung satu orang membawa satu botol aqua, eh, maksudnya, sorry bukan aqua, air mineral, itu artinya 500 botol minimal itu terkumpul di Ranupani dan Ranupani itu enclave. Jadi dia salurannya nggak ada kemana. Sementara untuk membangun TPA di dalam Taman Nasional tidak memungkinkan. Jadi uh, konfliknya di situ. Nah kemudian uh, Bromo termasuk dalam 10 uh, destinasi prioritas. Artinya akan menambah kunjungan yang lebih banyak lagi. Akan menambah tekanan terhadap uh, ekosistem yang ada di sana. Ini menjadi uh, apa istilahnya observasi lagi bagi pemerintah pusat ketika menerapkan aturan ke daerah apakah itu fit dengan uh, kondisi yang ada di masing-masing lokasi yang kedua adalah kasusnya adalah uh, perhutanan sosial jadi itu justru menam- memberi sarana untuk membuka hutan next lanjut nah uh, ada sistem lagi yaitu uh, turis apa wisata minat khusus yang ini dilakukan di TNBTS di sisi selatan. Bagaimana mereka mengundang wisatawan tapi hanya terbatas yaitu untuk pengamatan anggrek dan burung. Ini ada di sisi selatan kalau di Ranupane adalah sisi barat dari Semeru. Next. Kurang lebih ini. Jadi uh, keragaman anggrek uh, Indonesia yang ada di Ranu Darungan atau sisi selatan ya ini di Kabupaten Lumajang ini yang menjadi daya tarik wisatawan. Jadi dalam sehari dia hanya menerima maksimal lima, lima orang untuk eh, apa berwisata di sana. Dan ini cara TNBTS untuk memecah eh, yang tadi tidak hanya ke Bromo dan Semeru, tetapi ada tujuan wisata lain loh yang ada di sini. Kurang lebih begitu. Lanjut. Nah, sama seperti di Ranupane tadi ada eh, Andi. Di sini ada salah satu staff eh, TNBTS yang memang sangat mencintai anggrek. namanya Pak Tony Artaka, beliaulah yang kemudian mengedukasi yang dulu para hunter, kemudian menjadi kader konservasi. Mereka punya kesadaran dan akhirnya menjadi guide dan menjadi e, mendadikan lokasi Ranu Darungan sebagai tujuan wisata. Penghasilannya yang tadinya menjual anggrek e, dari mengambil Taman Nasional, sekarang mendapat penghasilan dari guide. Jadi e, ekonominya lebih, lebih legalnya di sana, bukan lagi mengambil anggrek. Next. Saya rasa itu next. Oh, ini aktivitas yang di nah sebelumnya uh, yang next next. Nah, ini mungkin uh, bisa menjadi highlight bagi para peneliti yang mau masuk ke sana, ada beberapa hal yang bisa uh, kita ajukan untuk proyek ini. Yang pertama adalah mungkin data tadi data pohon rimba, yang kedua adalah impact dari uh, kemitraan uh, konservasi atau perhutanan sosial di wilayah konservasi itu sejauh mana impact-nya. Kemudian yang ketiga adalah uh, impact terhadap tujuan 10 destinasi minat khusus. Itu yang keempat adalah uh, eksplorasi spesies. Itu sih dari saya. Terima kasih waktu saya kembalikan ke Pak Bo. Oh, interesting. So, uh, Ibu Titi present the other way round compared to previous uh, presentation. Uh, when in Papua heavily degraded but then in the uh, Bromo Tengger Bromo Tengger is the name Bromo Tengger National Park a new hope arise because uh, the local people then knows about uh, the importance and the value of the so called reforestation or afforestation and then not only planting the trees but also income opportunity rise so this is i think uh, a new uh, 
findings that particularly happen in the nature conservation park. Yeah? So this is a lot of uh, some summaries for Ibu Titi. And gentlemen, in the life of me, will present about the, uh, Mas Dana will present about mutualism. Please, Pak Mas Dana. Thank you, Prof. For the time, I will speak in Bahasa and present my presentation in Bahasa. Ya, kali ini saya akan mempresentasikan mengenai uh, liputan saya uh, proyek yang dibiayai oleh uh, Police Center melalui program uh, Rainforest Journalism Fund tentang mutualisme. Next. Saya mengambil uh, tempat lokasi di hutan Petung Griono, yaitu uh, hutan hujan tropis uh, yang ada di Pekalongan di Jawa Tengah jaraknya sekitar 34-35 kiloan dari kota Kajen. Dari eh, kota Kajen adalah ibu kota Kabupaten Pekalongan. Hutan tersebut masih satu bentang dengan kawasan pegunungan Dieng dan memang tipikal hutan dataran rendah, lowland, dengan ketinggian sekitar 500 sampai 1.700an mdpl. Karena tipikal hutan lowland, pastinya akan mempunyai banyak keanerakaban hayati di dalamnya, baik itu flora maupun fauna. Termasuk dari catatan saya adalah ada dua flora, ada dua fauna endemik yang ternyata statusnya terancam punah berdasarkan laporan IUCN yaitu Owa Jawa dan burung raja udang atau kingfisher. Next, ya karena Tingkat keanekaragaman hayatinya yang cukup tinggi, maka tingkat keterancamannya juga cukup tinggi. Mengapa? Karena hutan hujan tropis Petung Kriono ini berada di kawasan luar konservasi, tidak masuk kawasan konservasi. Berbeda dengan kawasan taman nasional atau kawasan suaka alam yang memang dilindungi undang-undang, dilindungi oleh pemerintah. Kemudian, karena hutan ini milik PT Perhutani, milik BUMN, Sebagian besar aktivitas yang ada di hutan adalah berbasiskan bisnis, berbasiskan profit, sehingga pengawasan di hutan tersebut tidak ketat. Maka perlu untuk pengawasan hutan tersebut agar tetap lestari, agar tetap uh, terjaga dengan melibatkan masyarakat, dengan melibatkan uh, masyarakat yang tinggal di hutan, masyarakat di desa setempat. Nextnya, ya, karena faktor Ekonomi mendominasi sebelumnya ada aksi-aksi deforestasi, aksi penebangan, aksi perburuan satwa di hutan Betung Kriono juga terjadi dan mungkin sampai saat ini masih terjadi hanya intensitasnya mas, sudah berkurang. Mereka melakukan itu karena e, desakan ekonomi, karena uang, karena penghasilan, karena pemasukan, maka perlu substitusi kegiatan, perlu substitusi penghasilan, substitusi pemasukan kepada mereka. Dari yang mereka hanya berpikiran eksploitatif menjadi kekonservatif dengan memanfaatkan, dengan memanfaatkan produk hutan yang ada di hutan Petung Kriono. Next. Ya, salah satunya adalah dengan eh, pemanfaatan produk hutan berupa kopi. Kopi sebenarnya di hutan Petung Kriono sudah ada sejak lama, hanya saja tidak termaksimalkan atau termanfaatkan secara baik potensi kopi di hutan tersebut. Produknya hanya ala kadarnya dan masyarakat memang belum mengetahui potensinya. Melalui pendampingan NGO lokal, suara OWA yang memang konsen juga terhadap konservasi satwa OWA Jawa dan juga hutan tersebut, mereka diberikan pengetahuan, mereka diberikan bimbingan, mereka diberikan Bagaimana cara mendekatkan pendekatan eh, dengan melakukan pendekatan kopi cara sortasinya, pemilihannya, kemudian cara sangrai, roasting dan lainnya, termasuk pemasarannya hingga sampai ke Singapura dan Amerika. Sebab eh, kopi ini cukup cukup spesial karena memang tumbuh di bawah tegakan dengan konsep set ground coffee, jadi 
sangat organik juga dan masyarakat juga sudah mengetahui bahwa untuk panennya mereka juga tidak sporadis, sporadis dan masif ketika ada buah ya mereka panen, kalau nggak ada ya mereka tidak akan memanennya. Lalu pemanfaatan produk hutan lain yaitu e, nira menjadi gula aren atau gula semut atau e, banyak di pasaran brown sugar beda dengan gula merah kalau gula merah kan dari kelapa. Pengelolaannya juga juga organik e, warga setempat juga mengolahnya juga menggunakan bahan-bahan non kimiawi karena mereka pun untuk pengeringannya juga memanfaatkan e, sinar matahari atau cahaya matahari yang ada di e, di hutan Putung Kriyono. Next lagi. Next lagi. Nah, aksi deforestasi e, di hutan tersebut sebelumnya juga tidak secara spesifik menebang dan memburu, namun juga cara pemanenan yang tidak pas itu juga merusak pohon. Salah satunya adalah pemanenan madu yang banyak dilakukan masyarakat sekitar dengan merusak sarang ketika mengambil madu merusak sarang mereka merusak koloni mereka hanya tinggal diambil madunya mereka kini sudah membudidayakan budidaya lebah tanpa sengat dengan meliponikultur dan karena tanpa sengat dan mudah untuk dipraktekkan di rumah maka ibu-ibu rumah tangga kemudian anak muda juga ikut membudidayakannya next ya aksi reforestasi, aksi reforestasi mereka eh, cukup berdampak eh, terhadap jasa lingkungan atau ekosistem services di hutan putung kriyono karena memberikan eh, manfaat baik itu fisik maupun non fisik kalau fisiknya berupa eh, nilai jual dari produk-produk hutan tadi, kemudian non fiksinya adalah ekologi seperti terjaganya keanehragaman hayati sehingga menjadi sistem penyangga kehidupan bagi mereka dan juga tidak hanya di dalam hutan maupun juga di, di luar hutan. Di satu sisi adalah e, pemanfaatan jasa lingkungan mereka adalah dengan debit air dimanfaatkan sebagai sumber listrik untuk melistriki desa mereka. Listrik tersebut listrik yang ramah satwa dan ramah lingkungan. Kenapa? Karena e, mereka pun men-setting e, pembangkit listrik mikrohidro itu dengan e, menggunakan kabel ini, kabelnya dengan yang sudah berisolasi. Ketika ada satwa yang melintas atau berakiasi melintasi kabel tersebut juga tidak akan e, membahayakan. Dan juga karena sumbernya adalah sumber air sehingga mereka lebih bisa menjaga hutan karena dengan kalau mereka tidak menjaga hutan pasti pasukan listrik juga akan terganggu seperti itu. Lalu manfaat dengan listrik e, ber, manfaat dengan pemanfaatan listrik tersebut warga bisa mandiri secara ekonomi dan keteraksesan informasi juga masuk ke ke mereka dan secara tidak langsung itu juga mengurangi e, tingkat kemiskinan. Mereka warga desa yang sebelumnya, sebelumnya migran untuk bekerja ke kota ke daerah lain mereka sudah bisa memanfaatkan uh, peluang usaha di desa tersebut nextnya ya reforestasi harus dilakukan secara berkelanjutan uh, kalau dari dalam sudah mereka lakukan kemudian kalau dari luar juga perlu mendapatkan dukungan juga perlu mendapatkan pengetahuan bagaimana informasi-informasi itu saya sajikan dengan menyasar audiens kalangan anak muda. Ya, produk liputan saya di IDN Times juga ditujukan untuk mereka milenial dan generasi Z karena perlu meletakkan pondasi pengetahuan mengenai reforestasi dan juga konservasi. Betapa pentingnya menjaga hutan hujan tropis eh, kepada mereka. Nah, Kisah-kisah tadi memang perlu milenial diajak untuk dirangkul, di, memahami dengan bahasa yang sederhana, dengan uh, platform atau style circle mereka, dengan kebiasaan-kebiasaan mereka. Kalau mereka biasanya uh, suka dengan foto, maka dalam liputan ini juga saya tidak hanya membuat foto, tidak hanya membuat tulisan, tapi juga membuat uh, 
podcast, terus kemudian distribusi uh, produk liputannya juga bermacam-macam melalui media sosial yang memang dekat dengan uh, mereka. Next. Ya, ini sta- adalah statistik uh, internal kami bahwa memang produk uh, liputan atau untuk liputan reforestasi memang berkelanjutan salah satunya juga untuk menanamkan informasi saksi story-nya kepada uh, anak-anak muda bahwa platform yang kami gunakan uh, cukup beragam tapi uh, video memang menjadi kesukaan atau favorit mereka para uh, milenial dan gen Z dan memang uh, cukup berhasil meletakkan informasi atau fondasi soal konservasi, soal reforestasi terhadap kalangan anak muda. Saya akan berikan salah satu cuplikan video uh, dari liputan saya. Sebenarnya apa yang menyebabkan mereka nebang, ngawa, apa yang menyebabkan mereka berburu ini apa sebenarnya Mas Anad? Kan nah setelah itu ada benang merah bahwa ada masalah ekonomi juga yang sebenarnya mendasari atau jadi masalah utama di sana. Kalau kita mau ngajak orang lain supaya peduli ya, kita harus peduli terlebih dahulu gitu. Kopi, hutan, owa itu ya harus kita uh, ya pilihlah cara ngergani supaya ini mempunyai nilai yang lebih gitu di, karena itu dari sekitar kita sebenarnya Wawan itu punya ide sendiri dan salah satunya kita angkat ekonomi Petung Riono salah satunya adalah kopi yang yang dari dulu itu ada di hutan sawah kembang tapi tidak bisa dimanfaatkan ya bisa dimanfaatkan tapi hasilnya itu lebih rendah awal-awal sih kaget juga mas karena biasa nangkep burung hasilnya sehari sekian sehari sekian terus berhenti terus paling pendapatan seperti penjualan kopi itu belum seberapa lah tapi saya nikmati saya rasain itu sebenarnya lebih enak penjualan kopi e, saya ambil keputusan yo pelan-pelan kita beralih pekerjaan mengolah kopi dan alhamdulillah yo sudah ada perubahan mas Kalau saya sendiri yang menjual itu, kalau kirim-kirim di wilayah Indonesia sendiri, itu sampai ke Jawa Timur, ke Jakarta, itu udah biasa, Mas. Nah, kalau, kalau di luar itu malah Singapura, Mas. We at Wildlife Reserve Singapore support and promote the use of sustainably produced products. We've been serving over coffee in our parks since 2017, and our visitors really appreciate the robust flavors of this coffee. We've also taken the coffee outside of our parks to the wider audience in Singapore through the Singapore Coffee Festival in 2017. These platforms provide us a great opportunity to educate the public on how a simple choice as to where they get their daily coffee from can help protect wildlife. Kalau di sini selain kopi juga sebenarnya ada mas produk lokal yang bagus di Petung Riona itu ada ya gula aren itu termasuk dari dulu itu udah ada gula aren tapi penjualannya itu masih standar-standar aja karena memang belum dikemas. Kalau di kecamatan Petung Riona itu kalau petani ini itu yo cuma saya aja. Kenapa saya fokus ke nera karena memang turun temurun dari Buyut sampai kakek, bahkan kalau generasi penerusnya itu, misalnya anak saya itu mau, juga bisa masih kemur lagi. Sing saking kajangan ini kok, terus mau ditumbah sih ten rindiran. Mireng-mireng yang medang ini kok rasa kok benten, ngeten. Diusit beriki, sarang beriki. Bah, aku tolong kayak ngegulas ini. 
angku lemah kan sabit kata kata hang anu ga anu pak ya pirang kilo pirang kilo seanane lah itu yang pertama sekilo rong kilo mountain malik yang sal kilo lah ni aku terus langsung ni naik sakit bentar naik gendi si mountain sing saya sakit kawan kilo setinten naik gula semut di sini aku Dirajang, dirajang kan jemur, kan tiga. Di mana mau tendadas, dia yakin penting. Terus di blender, blender lengket, mau tendadas, kantas mulai. Aku lo akal, mau tentarin apa apa, ni aku dah mau gula semut. Dah tipe dah, mau garing dah tipe. Tambun pertama ni aku mau garing, tipe tau ten juga. Lambung pulau kan jamur malih, jamur malih. Kalau diperhatikan, kalau dinikmati sekarang, ya lebih menguntungkan nira daripada memburu. Hasilnya sedikit, tapi apa ya? Dalam perasaan itu nyaman. akan mengetahui di mana saja lokasi-lokasi home ring uh, Owa Jawa dan kemudian titik-titik uh, uh, jalur macan tutul di situ seperti itu. Lalu juga bisa melakukan lokakarya karya untuk kalangan anak-anak muda di sekitar hutan agar mereka tertarik menjadi petani nira yang memang tantangannya adalah uh, minim regenerasi. Untuk bisa naik perlu keterampilan, bisa naik pohon aren perlu keterampilan khusus dan itu dibutuhkan. Juga bisa melakukan asesmen atau training e, mengenai pengelolaan sampah plastik yang ada di hutan karena masifnya pembukaan tempat-tempat wisata di hutan Betong Kreno yang memang e, basicnya hutan tersebut e, milik BUMN dan juga berbasiskan pada profit maka juga rentan terhadap e, sampah plastik makanan bot makanan baik itu botol yang juga itu akan mengganggu satwa dan akan mengganggu hutan. Mereka pun juga misalkan sampah itu larut ke hanyut di sungai juga akan mengganggu sumber listrik mereka. Atau dengan melalui uh, stadium visit, uh, mahasiswa juga agar bisa mengetahui sukses story mereka secara lebih dekat ke lokasi, sehingga itu bisa di, mahasiswa bisa menjadi influencer mereka dan uh, aksi re reforestasi pasti akan berkelanjutan dengan uh, memanfaatkan dana hibah tadi melalui program Impact Seed Funding dan Pulitzer Center uh, insya Allah upaya untuk reforestasi berkelanjutan uh, bisa dilakukan dengan lebih baik. Terima kasih. So, uh, Mr. Dana, explain in short how about the relation, intimate relation and uh, uh, mutualism between high diversity forest, lowland forest particularly, uh, uh, the people uh, said it was a forest of local term, Petung Kriyono, a lowland forest at the district of Pekalongan, Central Java. So the interesting in, in his story that he explained the relation between forest, coffee, and monkey, the so-called oa. This is on, this kind of monkey is only living in the upper uh, forest. Yeah. Upper, it's not she did not goes to the land or or below. Different with orangutan. This is on the in the canopy of the forest. Yeah. So, uh, well, the relation between the forest, coffee, and the owa, 
So, I, so when we see the kopi owa, particularly, is not different with a kopi luwak. Luwak, yeah, this kopi luwak is quite different because kopi luwak uh, from faces because of the discretion or from faces of the luwak. <laughs> but this is not the uh, the. The owa coffee is different. So this is robusta export to Singapore. You can you see that, and then uh, in an organic way. And the, the other interesting is the palm sugar, and uh, how they use the electricity by microhydro. So this kind of small village, surrounded by dense population in Central Java they can survive and sustainably use the resource. Um, I think this is the interesting one. And it is a small hope that can be extend to the other place, particularly in Java, where the highest population density in the world are in Java. So you have many studies about that since uh, perhaps three decades ago, uh, how the so-called uh, in inner Java and in inner Indonesia, the poverty, the share poverty, are emerged in the local population of Java, which is quite different in the outer Java. So this is the time for us to discuss uh, according to my time. We still have about 20 minutes. 20 minutes to ask. Ibu Melani, Mrs. Melani, any others? Can you mention? Yeah. Humaira? Ina. Okay, two. Please, Ibu Melani, and then follow by Ibu Ina. Uh, terima, uh, terima kasih. Uh, my name is Melani Abdul Kadir Sunito. I'm a lecturer at... Uh, Department of uh, Communication Science and Community Development, and I'm also a fellow at the Samdana Institute, uh, um, an NGO in uh, conservation and community development. Uh, I'm going to speak in Bahasa. Uh, permit me, because uh, I'm going to mostly speak to the, the speaker in front. Mbak um, Titi dan uh, Mas Dana, saya merasa diajak jalan-jalan karena ini dua tempat yang sangat saya kenal. Saya berasal dari Malang uh, dan uh, 2012 saya mengantar mahasiswa KKN ke Petung Kriyono dan itu uh, dua tempat yang luar biasa. Uh, pada saat yang sama saya juga sudah lama memiliki teman-teman yang mengembangkan hutan organik di uh, Megamendung, daerah Megamendung. Namanya hutan organik jadi daerah yang dulunya adalah bekas uh, kebun teh yang sudah terlantar dan kemudian ini ditanami kembali dan sekarang menjadi menjadi hutan. Persis seperti yang, apa yang dikerjakan oleh Mbak Titi. Yang saya bayangkan kemudian adalah begini. Tadi kita ngobrol dengan Mas Mas Hari, teman teman sangat baik saya dan teman baru saya Mas Yuda. Uh, apakah kita bisa membuat satu cara untuk menginformasikan di mana saja tempat-tempat di mana community itu mengembangkan konservasi-konservasi ini sebagai counter dari upaya besar untuk deforestasi dan yang luar biasa ini. Jadi kemudian ini kemudian dimasukkan ke dalam semacam peta atau whatever gitu. Tapi ini kan ada di di apa? Jawa Timur, Jawa Tengah ada, Jawa Barat ada. Dan kemudian kita bisa menyusun semacam koridor di mana kemudian dan kalau itu dipetakan kita akan menjadi tahu di mana kita akan membuat tempat-tempat baru itu supaya ini menjadi semacam koridor konservasi Jawa. Saya rasa Pak Bowo bisa menjelaskan panjang lebar betapa Jawa itu salah satu wilayah yang sudah sangat kacau secara ekologis gitu. Tapi kita punya spots ini dan kita kemudian melihat gerak masyarakat untuk untuk mengembangkan ini. Saya rasa gagasan untuk membuat semacam koridor Jawa ini uh, luar biasa di teman-teman dari Reading besok akan ke Cibu, Cibulau dan Cibulau juga ada teman-teman yang mengembangkan kopi 
konservasi seperti Mas Dana juga itu jadi ada tapi kalau saya kemudian mencari informasi itu kemana untuk dapat gambaran ini saya rasa mungkin kita bisa menggunakan kerjasama antara teman-teman jurnalis kemudian juga komunitas di tingkat lokal dan kemudian saya males disebut saintis tapi oke okay. <laughs> kelompok kelompok ini kemudian untuk gabungan saya, saya rasa okay. itu Thank bagaimana you. pandangan terima kasih okay. uh, basically what uh, Mrs Melani asking is about is it possible that the local initiative like in Pekalongan in Central Java and East Java this is sounds like a uh, an uh, small island in the vast open sea. So can we in the future connect it, the dot, connecting the dot with the initiative? So everybody can also, people in the city, people in Sumatra Island out of Java can also know the, how the initiative can be extend and involve all all the communities across in Indonesia and also particularly also from uh, uh, abroad so uh, this is the question and please but okay check thank you for the opportunity Mr. Bowo my name is Ina I'm from I'm a student from science communication community development and I would like to answer uh, I would like to ask question to professor Kazuke that's very interesting uh, presentation from you professor uh, from your presentation we know that there are still big gap that we can find in uh, land ownership in Indonesia so that's why our government uh, release and implement a land reform program agrarian program reforms and uh, from one of the program from our government in Indonesia is about uh, legalization asset, asset legalization in Indonesia through uh, land registration. Uh, also, we know that in Indonesia, it still can found, it can be found a lot of com communal and in indigenous local people and indigenous local people, they do believe in communal land ownership. So from those cases, we can see the different perspective of our government and our uh, indigenous local people. So I would, I would like to ask your opinion or your thought about this case, because if our government still um, release this program and implement this program, there will be a crush, there will be a conflict that occur in the future. Thank you. Okay. Uh, perhaps for Ibu Melani, you can answer in short, both of you, and then follow by Pak mm. Mizun. Uh, terima kasih Bu Melani mungkin memang uh, perlu ada itu pemetaan karena setiap daerah punya cara sendiri untuk menghijaukan dan kesadaran masyarakat ini yang perlu ditumbuhkan sehingga bukan hanya program pemerintah tetapi inisiatif masing-masing daerah ini yang perlu di highlight kalau seperti itu akan menjadi apa ya semacam gerakan swadaya yang seluruh Indonesia mungkin tidak hanya di Jawa juga banyak local hero di beberapa tempat Saya rasa demikian Ibu. Terima kasih. Iya. Cek. Iya, terima kasih. Memang eh, perlu inisiatif dan juga kolaborasi untuk bisa menghadirkan inovasi, mengetahui informasi mana saja community-community bis yang memang sudah berkembang, mana yang belum sehingga ada lahan 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 baru yang bisa digarap dan juga dikerjakan oleh para saintis. Salah satunya itu yang yang uh, saya berharap uh, infeksi funding itu bisa dimanfaatkan untuk kemudian tadi bahwa ada upaya reforestasi itu berkelanjutan. Kalau hanya sampai di mereka, tapi dari sisi luar hutannya juga sama aja. 
maka akan mereka juga akan uh, tergerus uh, pengetahuan pengetahuan itu dan dan memang pemetaan informasi untuk bisa dijadikan satu uh, koridor atau connecting the dot itu perlu agar publik juga mengetahui at least pemerintah juga akan setidaknya dengan informasi tersebut juga akan mengaruhi kebijakan publik mereka memang uh, sangat diharapkan dan sangat diperlukan dan kami juga sebagai jurnalis hanya bisa mengangkat ini agar hmm. uh, informasi ini juga uh, sampai kepada publik atau audiens tapi what's next nya itu yang perlu dipikirkan agar tetap berkelanjutan dan tidak hanya berhenti di saya sebagai jurnalis di mereka uh, community bisa berkelanjutan semuanya terima kasih uh, may I trans, uh, translate for in short so both of them uh, in conclusion that if regarding the question of Ibu Melani the answer is a combination between collaboration and diversity how to collaborate with the other actor outside the community perhaps until the international wide but then should be respect to its diversity of its location that you mentioned so this is the combination of their answer yeah, yeah thank you very much uh, the di direction of the issue uh, is somewhat clear uh, Indonesian government implement the ag reform agraria agrarian reform uh, based on the tap ampere uh, duaribu uh, 2002 and also Kuputusan Mahkamah Mahkamah Konstitusi and decision of the uh, constitutional uh, constitutional court uh, 2012 uh, those uh, decision uh, decision uh, store the uh, communal right mm -mm. Uh, of local people so those directions should be uh, promoted uh, uh, for example uh, there is now uh, Utan Adat uh, communal forest can be recognized but uh, until now only 40 around 40 or 50 uh, thousand hectares was recognized as uh, many places but uh, compared with the vast area that uh, controlled by local people the number is still so small so uh, uh, so uh, we we should promote the <laughs> prom promote the direction, uh, recognizing the uh, co uh, right of com uh, uh, communities, uh, people or com communal communal right. Under uh, under uh, uh, agraria, uh, basic agraria law, uh, 1960 also uh, recognized that the uh, uh, communal right. Uh, uh, is the base of the uh, property right in Indonesia. So basic uh, foundation is, uh, is is exist in Indonesia. So we can uh, promote those uh, direction. I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we are not meet in Manado last week. Yeah. I also go to yeah, Manado yeah. to the international symposium on journal anthropology Indonesia. And I, at the time, I present well, about the problem and challenge on the uh, customary forest yeah. acknowledgement by the government. So, yes, you're right. And it is still, because of the effort, uh, I'll not spend by government, are so limited. But up to present, only 90,000 hectares already of customary forest already acknowledged, which is about 90. Uh, customary community that own 70,000 of hectares and it should be extend but uh, the the problem is the limited resource and limited anthropologists to accompany uh, the process of uh, forest acknowledgement thank you uh, the time already finished Thank you for all, Professor Mizuno, Mbak Titi, Mas Dana, and all the participants that question and also comment to the presenter. Thank you to you all.
I have a nice day, and then I, I give to the moderator, I mean the committee. Please, thank you. All right, thank you so much for Dr. Suryo Adiwibowo as a moderator, and also thank you to all the speakers that have present, presented very well. And to all the, mod, uh, to all the par presenter and the moderator, you can join us downstairs because we're going to give a certificate and placard. To give this placard and certificate, we invite Professor Arya Haridharmawan as a head of the Department of Communication and Community Development. The first placard and certificate will be given to Dr. Suryo Adiwibowo as a moderator. The second placard and certificate will be given to Professor Kosuke Mizuno as a presenter of this session. The third placard and certificate will be given to Ms. Titi Kartitiani. And last but not least, the last certificate and placard will be given to Mr. Dana Kencana. All right, let's, uh, let's take a picture together. One, two, three. Cheers. All right. Okay, you can now back to your seat. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Professor. Okay, on to the next agenda. We are going to hear about amazing socialization of impact seed funding that will be presented by Ms. Granty Paramita from Pulitzer Center. So we're coming to the stage, Ms. Granty Paramita. Halo, selamat siang semuanya. Mudah-mudahan belum bosan ya, lihat saya. <laughs> uh, Oke, okay. uh, untuk sesi kali ini kita akan membahas mengenai suatu inisiatif baru dari Pulitzer Center. Mungkin izin saya pakai bahasa Indonesia mungkin ya untuk sekarang ya. Um, mungkin pertanyaan dari tadi setelah kita sudah sharing bersama, mendengar berbagai pengalaman dan juga reporting dari rekan-rekan jurnalis dan juga riset, kita bisa melihat bagaimana overlapping passion dan juga interest dari kedua belah pihak ya. Baik itu di data mungkin, ataupun di riset dan juga untuk melihat dampak sosial dan ekonomi di uh, desa dan di hutan, seperti itu. Maka pertanyaan besarnya adalah what's next? Dan untuk itu Pulitzer Center ingin memberikan suatu platform atau memberikan suatu um, fasilitasi untuk para jurnalis dan saintis untuk bisa dapat uh, berkolaborasi atau mengambil inspirasi dari uh, reporting yang sudah kami share di uh, pada beberapa program yang ada di Pulitzer Center. Seperti itu. Next. Oke, okay. konteksnya pertama di sini adalah karena uh, tentu saja di dunia akademik kita juga sangat mengakui penggunaan grey literature ya. Uh, ini adalah uh, termasuk dari reporting-reporting yang sudah 
di share dan juga data-data di, yang ada di dalam sana yang data yang sudah diolah juga oleh para rekan-rekan uh, fellow dan juga grantis dari Pulitzer Center. Jadi sebenarnya uh, kita bisa melihat bagaimana penggunaan data di dalam ke, dari dunia, du, dua dunia ini sudah saling uh, melengkapi seperti itu dan uh, saling mensuplementasi. Uh, jurnalis dan saintis tentunya men-share passion uh, pada environment gitu ya dan climate change dan juga data. Uh, lalu yang ketiga juga deforestasi tadi seperti yang sudah di-share oleh Carol mungkin ya tadi uh, bahwa sangat uh, cukup cukup tidak mengembirakan karena region kita ini di Southeast Asia uh, rate-nya sangat tinggi untuk deforestasi. Uh, saat ini kita kehilangan 1,2 persen uh, hutan setiap tahunnya. Uh, jadi kita itu yang paling cepat di antara tiga region lainnya yaitu Latin Amerika dan juga Afrika. Uh, kita juga melihat konteks bahwa kita ingin memberikan uh, platform untuk men-enable uh, suara-suara dari lokal akademik dan juga uh, lokal jurnalis seperti itu. Jadi dengan uh, impact seed funding ini kami ingin memberikan fasilitasi kepada semua uh, jurnalis dan juga saintis uh, dimanapun berada ya, tidak hanya yang ada di kota-kota besar mungkin meskipun kita juga merasakan dampaknya dari deforestasi tapi juga bringing the stories uh, closer to, to home. Jadi artinya kita ingin mengenable um, kolaborasi yang ada di lapangan seperti itu lebih dekat. Next, oke, okay. impact seed funding itu apa sih? Impact seed funding itu adalah dana mikro uh, untuk memfasilitasi uh, further education related activities yang mengambil inspirasi dari underreported stories uh, yang terkait dengan hutan uh, di bawah program. Rainforest Journalism Fund dan Rainforest Investigative Network. Nah ini bisa jadi mengambil inspirasi itu dari uh, topik-topiknya seperti itu ya tadi misalnya uh, ada tentang madu kelenceng tadi yang ada di hutan petung kriono mungkin uh, lalu tadi jelas yang sudah kita dengar dari Bu Titi mengenai ada anggrek baru yang spesies anggrek baru yang ditemukan yang endemik lalu mungkin juga um, selain itu juga atau mengambil mengenai subjek dari desanya itu sendiri atau hutannya itu sendiri gitu. Uh, kita ingin mencapai uh, impact seperti itu ya dari reportase ini. Kita ingin mengeksplor uh, respon dari teman-teman uh, akademisi atau uh, saintis gitu. Responnya seperti apa sih terhadap uh, informasi yang sudah uh, dibagikan oleh rekan-rekan jurnalis seperti itu. Uh, next. Uh, sekedar sharing. Uh, untuk saat ini uh, kita punya, ada dua ya tadi saya sudah share mengenai RJF, Rainforest Journalism Fund, dan juga Rainforest Investigative uh, Network, Investigation Network. Uh, untuk RJF sendiri, uh, di sini itu kami sudah sangat luas ya, through archipelago untuk reportasenya. Dan di sini kalau rekan-rekan uh, di sini dan di uh, online, um, visit ke website kami, di atasnya itu ada yang namanya Interaction Interactive Map, di sana bisa dilihat uh, di mana saja reportase yang sudah uh, dilakukan oleh rekan-rekan dari uh, fellow kami seperti itu ya. Nah ini konsentrasinya seperti di, bisa dilihat di layar, uh, ada di Kalimantan, uh, tentunya ada di Sulawesi juga dan di Sumatera, uh, lalu ada juga di Papua ya tadi seperti yang Mas Batya share. Uh, tentunya ada juga di Jawa beberapa stories mengenai hutan ini. Dan kita harap rekan-rekan uh, yang ada di IPB ini, karena saya tahu di IPB ini kan very internasional dan juga jangkauan risetnya sangat luas seperti itu ya termasuk ke daerah-daerah ini mungkin bisa uh, mulai memikirkan uh, apa sih uh, overlappingnya dengan rekan-rekan jurnalis yang tadi sudah share. Next. Uh, mungkin hanya sekelabat saja karena nanti kalau rekan-rekan setelah acara ini memvisit uh, website kami uh, di pulitzercenter.org uh, di situ rekan-rekan bisa melihat di situ ada grants dan juga ada uh, fellows gitu ya bisa di, bisa ditekan di situ uh, jika visit ke Rainforest Journalism Fund dan juga Rainforest Investigative Network website uh, kita punya banyak sekali uh, story di sini dan sangat variatif ya jadi uh, silakan dilihat-lihat seperti itu meskipun untuk saat ini memang uh, 
search button kami itu masih berdasarkan region ya, jadi bukan berdasarkan negara, tapi mudah-mudahan uh, tetap lebih mudah dicari untuk mencari uh, inspirasi uh, dari story-story yang bisa dikerjasamakan seperti itu. Next, uh, kembali meng-highlight mengenai kekuatan dari uh, underreported stories yang dilakukan oleh pa para fellow dan juga grants uh, grantis kami, yaitu tentu saja uh, kami meng-highlight uh, dan raising awareness untuk urgent issues yang dihadapi uh, oleh dunia uh, tentang hutan hutan hujan ya seperti itu. Dan uh, kami bekerja dengan the most passionate journalist yang men menaruh perhatian terhadap uh, ecology preservation dan juga uh, forest communities at the center of reporting. Jadi jurnalis-jurnalis kami itu sangat berpihak kepada uh, forest communities seperti itu ya. Uh, dan juga sangat melihat uh, dinamika sosialnya juga. Jadi aspeknya itu ekologi dan juga sosial. Jadi cukup multidisipliner kalau rekan-rekan di sini visit ke website kami. Uh, yang ketiga juga kami sangat uh, mengharness penggunaan data dan juga pengolahan data uh, karena uh, untuk RIN kebetulan Departemen RIN ini uh, memiliki suat, uh, seorang uh, pakar seperti itu, pakar data yang dapat mengasis rekan-rekan jurnalis untuk pengolahan big data atau mungkin geospatial analysis gitu. Jadi rekan-rekan uh, jurnalis ini dibantu juga untuk akses-akses ke big data lainnya gitu. Next, uh, kekuatan yang berikutnya tentu saja uh, bisa dilihat ya dari tadi rekan-rekan di sini uh, jurnalis sudah sharing. Storytelling kami itu sangat interaktif dan juga uh, knowledge sharingnya itu sangat menarik. Jadi artinya di sini kalau para uh, scientist memiliki data yang sangat ekstensif terhadap risetnya, mungkin dengan kerjasama dengan uh, para para jurnalis di sini kita bisa juga uh, melihat bagaimana sih untuk penyajian presentasi dari riset itu sendiri misalnya seperti itu. Nah ini ada salah satu contoh yang saya presentasikan di sini adalah mengenai uh, kayan. Uh, itu dia letaknya ada di Kalimantan Utara dan ini reportasinya di, dilakukan oleh uh, Reza uh, Reza Aji uh, yang sekarang saat ini bekerja di uh, Rupa Data. Nah seperti yang rekan-rekan di sini lihat, misalnya beliau itu membandingkan ketinggian uh, waduk gitu yang waduk yang sedang dibangun pemerintah itu setinggi Monas seperti itu. Lalu di sini dia juga membahas mengenai hewan-hewan endemik yang terancam yang ada di sana. Tapi di sini disajikannya dengan sangat menarik. Jadi artinya kalau uh, dipakai misalnya di kelas mungkin uh, para dosen juga ingin memperkenalkan mengenai challenge-challenge developmental dan juga ekologi yang ada di uh, dan deforestasi tentunya itu bisa menggunakan uh, reportase yang di share ada di Pulitzer Center ini gitu karena uh, menurut kami uh, interaktif storytelling ini uh, menjadi kekuatan dari rekan-rekan uh, jurnalis dan fellow reporter jurnalis dan fellow kami next uh, selain itu yang sangat menarik di sini adalah uh, karena Pulitzer Center ini memang mungkin satu-satunya lembaga yang uh, ingin melakukan uh, outreach terhadap story-story yang sangat urgent ini Uh, kami juga memiliki uh, translationnya dari reportase ini kepada lesson plan seperti itu. Jadi misalnya kalau nanti uh, Bapak Ibu di sini uh, berkenan untuk memvisit website kami, itu ada button di bawah uh, bisa dipilih itu namanya uh, ada sectionnya namanya lesson plan gitu. Nah di sini lesson plannya itu bisa di, uh, dipakai untuk mengajar juga gitu. Nah ini salah satu contoh yang saya bawa di sini adalah ceritanya dari Carol yang tadi. Carol itu yang tadi uh, presentasi di sesi pertama ya dari Philippines. Uh, di sini uh, beliau itu membahas mengenai deforestasi di Philippines dan uh, lesson plan itu juga isinya sudah ada guide-nya misalnya ada berapa durasinya berapa lama, key questions apa yang akan diaddress di dalam kelas misalnya seperti itu. Dan, jadi itu sesuatu yang bisa kita olah bersama misalnya tadi uh, Bapak Ibu wah uh, sangat melihat reportasenya Mas Bagja di deforestasi di Kalimantan itu wah sangat menarik sekali nih untuk kita pakai di classroom misalnya. Itu dengan ISF ini kami juga bisa menjembatani hal tersebut untuk membuat lesson plan bersama dengan Bapak Ibu seperti itu. Next. Oke, okay, uh, tujuannya apa sih ISF ini? Yang pertama tentunya uh, kami ingin mengintensifikasi uh, kolaborasi antara jurnalis dan juga uh, saintis seperti itu ya. Nah, yang disebut 
uh, intensifikasi jurnalis ini, uh, sorry kolaborasi ini tidak hanya uh, yang baru, jadi artinya menginisiasi new collaboration, tapi juga bisa mendevelop existing collaborations. Misalnya kayak tadi Mbak Titi sudah bekerja sama dengan uh, researcher anggrek gitu ya. Nah itu bisa diperluas lagi misalnya dengan researcher IPB misalnya gitu. Nah itu uh, bisa di, difasilitasi dengan ISF ini seperti itu. Uh, yang berikutnya kami juga uh, menstimulasi penggunaan data dan informasi dari underreported stories ini ya seperti itu. Yeah. Next, oke okay. uh, ISF ini didesain untuk uh, menjadi sangat fleksibel dan responsif kepada kebutuhan-kebutuhan uh, di komunitas education dan juga forest community karena kita ingin allowing uh, applicants untuk mengestablish kegiatan-kegiatan uh, yang terkait dengan uh, urgent issues di forest dan kita tidak tidak ingin itu menjadi uh, terprescribe gitu ya kita tidak ingin mendiktate bentuknya itu apa karena uh, kita tahu bahwa saintis dan jurnalis lebih tahu di lapangan kebutuhannya seperti apa dan mungkin yang bisa dikembangkan seperti apa jadi di sini tidak ada limitasi ya uh, untuk bentuk kegiatan gitu tapi nanti mungkin perlu dikonsultasikan juga dengan uh, tim kami uh, karena namanya seed funding uh, tentunya ini micro scale Uh, karena durasi dari uh, aktivitas yang terpilih ini hanya berkisar sekitar 2-3 bulan kita tidak mensyaratkan untuk setahun durasi misalnya seperti yang lain tapi ini adalah short term ya uh, makanya micro, micro scale funding ini di kisaran 3.000-4.000 USD untuk uh, satu aktivitas ini uh, ya untuk timelinenya sendiri tadi saya sudah sebutkan ya 2-3 bulan Next, oke, okay. uh, mungkin kegiatannya apa saja sih? Uh, kalau mungkin rekan-rekan dosen di sini sedang menimbang kira-kira uh, apa yang bisa kita kerjasamakan dengan story-story uh, yang tadi sudah di, uh, di share ya, gitu. Uh, yang pertama, educational engagement, uh, misalnya insersi di dalam teaching materials, lalu bisa juga mengadakan on campus debates oleh rekan-rekan mahasiswa di sini. Saya juga terkesima ya karena di acara ini kita juga dibantu banyak oleh rekan-rekan mahasiswa dari IPB jadi ISF ini juga menjembatani hal-hal uh, tersebut ya jadi bisa uh, untuk on campus debate lalu uh, misalnya mau bikin lomba hackathon untuk ide-ide uh, social issues untuk membahas misalnya oh deforestasi yang ada di uh, disebabkan oleh food estate yang ada di Kalimantan tadi uh, student itu bisa menyumbang juga nih ide-idenya apa sih untuk addressing that social issues itu misalnya dengan uh, pengadaan lomba hackathon tadi gitu. Um, lalu kita juga juga sangat aware di sini ya bahwa di Indonesia ini kita sedang memiliki uh, program kampus merdeka yang sangat um, sangat novel dan in, uh, eksperimental seperti itu ya. Dan uh, di sini ISF juga berharap dapat uh, mensuplemen kegiatan-kegiatan uh, di kampus merdeka ya misalnya student visit ke desa atau ekspedisi misalnya biodiversity expedition oleh student atau mungkin tentunya dengan harus dengan supervisi dosen ya seperti itu uh, selain juga tadi yang saya sebutkan misalnya ada visit ke pedesaan atau ke hutan seperti itu kita juga uh, mendukung kegiatan-kegiatan untuk produksi visuals dan juga diseminasi nah misalnya student di sini karena kan di sini communication for development ya gitu student uh, mungkin ingin memproduksi podcast atau film dokumenter terkait dengan uh, deforestasi tadi atau mungkin tentang anggrek gitu atau mungkin tentang reforestasi yang ada di Petung Kriyono tentang uh, apa social social uh, angle di hutan Petung Kriyono tadi ya gitu yang sangat menarik itu uh, kita itu bisa difasilitasi juga oleh ISF jadi membuat uh, film dokumenter dan si film ini misalnya di, tentunya dipegang oleh para students yang ada di uh, kampus seperti itu. Uh, selain itu juga pameran kecil-kecilan gitu ya. Mungkin setelah uh, kita mengirim student pergi ke hutan misalnya, lalu mereka uh, kita ada ada fotografer di situ misalnya kita punya banyak foto, lalu uh, kita juga ada dokumentari. Bisa juga lalu kita bikin pameran gitu atau mungkin diskusi terkait dari visit tersebut di kampus gitu. Nah itu lebih ke education engagementnya. Um, 
untuk mobility dan forest community uh, engagement itu misalnya knowledge exchange activities gitu misalnya uh, kemarin Mbak Titi sempat uh, mention ke saya apakah bisa Mbak misalnya kita mengengage dosen IPB untuk um, bersama-sama mendiskusi mendiskusikan mengenai uh, anggrek gitu supaya lebih baik lagi kualitasnya secara manajemennya mungkin seperti itu di level komunitas nah itu uh, bisa juga Uh, students visit, of course, biodiversity expedition itu juga termasuk, dan uh, citizen citizen journalism seperti itu itu masuk juga kalau memang uh, bapak ibu di sini kepikiran uh, untuk menggunakan dana tersebut untuk uh, hal tersebut. Uh, yang terakhir tentunya sangat menarik juga yaitu adalah dukungan untuk research activities. Nah. Uh, di sini research activities kita 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 nggak nggak uh, mau ini ya over promising karena kalau research itu kan panjang ya kalau di sini sedangkan ISF itu hanya dua bulan gitu jadi uh, ini lebih ke support ke support ke main research activities jadi misalnya bapak ibu sedang uh, ada existing riset nih mengenai uh, deforestasi atau illegal logging seperti itu nah uh, kita sangat meng welcome dan menginvite bapak ibu untuk data adoption dari liputan-liputan yang ada di di bawah Pulitzer Center itu tadi data adoption untuk improving research accuracy gitu kan misalnya lalu misalnya Bapak Ibu sedang menulis buku gitu menulis buku tentang hutan di Jawa nah itu kita persilakan misalnya mengengage Mas Dana untuk jadi salah satu sumber untuk tulisan di dalam book chapter misalnya itu kita juga sangat mengencourage juga Uh, yang terakhir sangat menarik yaitu adalah fauna flora cataloging gitu. Jadi misalnya tadi ada uh, spesies anggrek baru atau mungkin ada uh, spesies hewan baru itu uh, kita bisa mensupport untuk cataloging uh, flora fauna dan juga mungkin uh, pemetaan ya gitu untuk publikasi ke dalam uh, website si katalognya itu. Ya. Uh, next, oke okay. uh, timelinenya. cukup uh, padat ya uh, untuk application proses sendiri kita akan go live itu besok mudah-mudahan kalau lancar semua uh, di August 12 uh, tapi cukup panjang uh, kita deadline-nya itu uh, sebulan lebih September 20 gitu kan nah mohon kalau Bapak Ibu tertarik untuk uh, mendaftar uh, silakan monggo hubungin saya atau um, bisa juga kalau mau follow sosial media kami nanti kita juga akan uh, umumkan di sana yang kedua selection prosesnya itu uh, seminggu September 21 sampai 29 pengumumannya di September 30 lalu uh, tentunya ada admin dan segala macam ya di Oktober awal implementasinya itu di bulan Oktober sampai sampai dengan Desember uh, 18 ya itu ya jadi sekitar dua bulanan gitu karena kita Kalau di Pulitzer Center tentunya kita tutup tahun ya di, di Desember itu. Jadi mudah-mudahan bisa terimplementasi dengan baik di bulan uh, Oktober sampai dengan Desember. Next. Oke, okay. jika di sini Bapak Ibu sudah mulai um, kepikiran ya untuk uh, partisipasi dalam ISF ini, beberapa hal yang perlu Bapak Ibu siapkan dan ini perlu disubmit ya ke online application-nya. Yang pertama adalah tentunya an overview mengenai proposed project-nya tidak lebih dari 250 kata. Nah, ini tidak enggak uh, tradisional ya untuk para dosen ini biasanya kan proposalnya panjang-panjang banget ya. <laughs> nah, kalau ini kita uh, pendek aja gitu. Yang penting uh, must include the objectives, target audience, activities, um, intended impact itu penting sekali dan rasionalnya itu apa aja. Lalu detail time frame Uh, budget esti- estimasi gitu kan, including uh, budget breakdown of cost. Di sini kita nggak nggak mengatur komponennya ya Bapak Ibu, jadi dipersilakan aja uh, untuk mempropos yang menjadi kebutuhan dari proyek yang Bapak Ibu uh, ingin ajukan ke kami. Um, nah, ada satu catatan mengenai uh, jenis activity uh, yaitu knowledge exchange uh, ke forest communities. Karena kami ini, kami merasa di Pulitzer Center bahwa tidak hanya kita yang bisa belajar gitu kan, apa namanya, tidak hanya kita yang juga pergi ke sana untuk belajar, tapi juga 
komunitas hutan juga bela- kita juga belajar dari komunitas hutan. Jadi kita sama-sama saling belajar dari uh, komunitas hutan juga. Nah, uh, maka itu kami mensyaratkan adanya statement dari member of community showing the need uh, from them. Itu jadi itu harus di uh, present. Nah, ini uh, bentuknya tidak harus yang resmi-resmi misalnya surat keterangan atau apa. Tapi bisa aja misalnya hanya just a message, quick message atau mungkin video ya yang menyatakan dari forest communities bahwa oh hey we need this kind of uh, capacity building or apa mungkin pendampingan seperti itu ya atau mungkin expert visit. Uh, nah itu um, kita harapkan ada statement dari uh, member of the community. Yang terakhir adalah copy of uh, curriculum vitae dan Uh, tentunya ini ya professional references uh, jadi untuk menyatakan bahwa departemen mengizinkan Bapak Ibu untuk melakukan uh, kegiatan ini ya yeah, next ya yeah. uh, ini adalah konteks saya mohon dapat dicatat uh, jika Bapak Ibu ada pertanyaan mohon layangkan ke dua kanal ini email at, atau um, HP saya seperti itu. Nah di di ba- paling bawah itu ada link ke website kami. Uh, silakan Bapak Ibu untuk uh, ini ya menunggu di link tersebut uh, untuk update-update yang akan kami uh, uh, perbarui seperti itu. Oke okay, mungkin uh, itu dari saya overview mengenai impact seed funding. Uh, sekarang saya akan membuka pertanyaan jika ada silakan Bapak Ibu yang berkenan memiliki pertanyaan. Oke. Okay. <laughs> Apakah di Zoom ada pertanyaan? Bisa dicek. Ya. Yeah. Oh, ya yeah, oke. Okay. Oke, okay, apakah sudah, uh, mudah-mudahan sudah cukup jelas ya, tapi jika ada pertanyaan lebih lanjut, uh, silakan nanti saya masih standby di sini sampai siang, jadi uh, kita bisa ngobrol setelah ini. Uh, mungkin itu dari saya, uh, terima kasih sekali uh, atas dukungan Bapak Ibu semua dan uh, Bapak Ibu yang telah meluangkan waktu untuk hadir ke dalam uh, acara ini, kita sangat senang uh, karena berkonek dengan Bapak Ibu di uh, pagi hari ini, mudah-mudahan Uh, kedepannya kerjasama kita terus terjalin dengan baik. Uh, mungkin itu Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you Miss Granti Paramita for your presentation. Wah Arlen, ini opportunity yang sangat besar ya, Betul. yang sangat bagus untuk kita semua di sini karena di ruangan ini mayoritasnya adalah scientist dan juga jurnalis. Jadi pasti uh, akan sangat-sangat bisa memanfaatkan kesempatan Betul. ini. Ya. Jangan disia-siakan itu. Yes, ya. Sekali lagi kita beri right. tepuk tangan, let's give it applause for Pulitzer Center on Impact Seed Funding. Okay ladies and gentlemen, before we end our event, we are going to hear closing remarks from the Director of International Education and Outreach that will be joining us by Zoom meeting. Mrs. Flora Pereira. Miss Flora Pereira, the time is yours. Yes, your voice sounds very clearly. Sorry, can 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 you hear me well? Yes, madam. Perfect. So, good afternoon, Selamat Siang. Uh, good afternoon, dear Pulitzer Center fellows, dear partners and friends, uh, Professor Dr. Ujang Sumar Wan, Professor Dr. Adia Hadida Marwan. Sorry if my pronunciation is is, is not the best. Uh, It's a great um, moment to hear. Oops. Can, can you hear me now? Because I'm hearing. Loud and clear, yes. Oops, there it is. Okay, I, I put it off on translation. Thank you very much. So, uh, again, it's a great uh, moment to be here. We are proud and uh, happy to. Uh, work with all of you in this launch of this, this initiative. 
We know we have seen it today, the deforestation, the intensification of extractivism and the consequential climate change is forcing us as society pro to problematize this man the mentoring concept of nature. And there is now a global understanding of the finitude of what has been so called, called natural resource. Uh, and it's clear as well that it's a shift of paradigm on the way we look at this and the way we are living and consuming and deforestating uh, has never been uh, so urgent. The International Outreach and Education Initiative is Pulitzer Center newest developed uh, within the rainforest activities. And it brings together specialists from across the globe, intertwining journalists, education and outreach in different and crucial climate hotspots in the world. And with that, we hope to foster engagement and generate impactful narratives on rainforest that will lead to forest preservation and hopefully to a stronger reconnection between humans and nature. Today, we are happy to launch the Southeast Asia Journalist Scientist Hub, coordinated by Granti Paramita. And this conference has marked the start of the Pulitzer Center International Education and Outreach Upcoming Activities on the region. It is our objective to reach an audience in the Southeast Asia, specifically Indonesia, where the severity of deforestation is important to be addressed and highlighted, connecting these two crucial stakeholders in telling the rainforest uh, story and, the rent and its people's story, the journalists and the scientists. We hope that the stories that our fellows and grantees have shared hopefully can be an eye open to many of us and enrich the work that we are all doing in the academic world. Uh, in the Pulitzer Center, we have been moved by this report from looking at the natural impact at the deforestation taking place in central Borneo, reports of the decreased number of Sumatran elephants to the community forts, to reforestation, and also the powerful cooperation that are dominating the forest in Sumatra in exchange of economic gain. Uh, we are happy, we are very happy to welcome the academic communities. Uh, to further engage in by participating in, the, in this initiative in the upcoming seminars and the knowledge exchange in the impacted funding grant is just presented and also in the training programs and opportunities that will come. As we take this initiative as experimental learning as well from the outset, we are seeing value in the impact anticipated through this engagement. The shared passion uh, in contribution to the environment and social issues are well, as well are working uh, with data. And we hope that the Southeast Asia Journalist Scientist Hub will be able to intensify the dialogue and bring the two parties close. We deeply believe that by connecting researchers and journalists, we'll be able to see important shifts in forces and dominance narratives about deforestation, about the dichotomy between nature and environment, about environmental crimes, and in the end, contribute to the protection of the Southeast Asia, Asian tropical forests, as well to the rights of their inhabitants and guardians. With that, I want to deeply thank you to our partners, the Bogor Agriculture University, to Rilset, and Forest Digest, that are leading the way with us, and the amazing journalists uh, that presented that work and that inspires the Pulitzer Center work every day. I also wanted to recognize Grantis' uh, effort to make this event possible today. For all, thank you so much for taking the time to attend the event and we are looking forward to further participation. Teri Makasi, thank you. Thank you so much for the closing remark, Ms. Pereira. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are also going to hear another closing remark from the Dean of Faculty of Human Ecology. Please welcome to the stage, Professor Dr. Ujang Sumarwan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon, good afternoon to all participants of this uh, the third 
Seminar International Conference on Rural Socioeconomic Transformation. And also, thank you very much for distinguished uh, speaker from UK, from Japan, and from other nations, and also from Indonesia, especially from the Department uh, Communication, IPB University. And thank you, the Honorable Professor Arya Hadi Darmawan, and Professor and also researcher who attend this uh, important seminar. Of course, our vision and mission is we don't want that the rural issue left behind because so many attention right now goes to urban areas. We can imagine if the issue of desforestation and the issue of rural area, like the issue of the most hot issue right now, the FS scandal. Yeah. Andaikan isu mengenai kehutanan dan desa ini, itu sama seperti isunya kasus FS, mungkin pemerintah akan memberikan perhatian yang sangat besar. Ya. Ya. Sayangnya isu ya, unfortunately, the issue of rural area as well as uh, forest as not as hot the issue of human uh, being, especially the celebrity. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to special thanks uh, also to the fellow student from University of Reading, you can stand up, yeah. Let's give them applause, yeah. And also, thank you very much to attend uh, this international. And also, we would like to thank you to all speaker. Please rise to all speaker, especially for the UK. From yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I think the conference is the important steps to build our collaboration because our problem cannot be solved without working together, without collaborate to each other. We have our strength by making working together. And I think no one can be achieved, nothing can be achieved without working together. And especially from developing country and developed countries. And especially, you know, the Indonesia, I think, have the largest rural communities as well as the rain forest area. So therefore, I think what happened in Indonesia will influence also to other countries and to the other region. So that's why researchers, experts from around the globe pay attention to our problem. So our problem, not just our problem, Indonesian problem, but also other nation problem. So I think on behalf of the IPB, I'm very pleased and thank you that all researchers and all experts attend, attended this international conference. And I hope that we, like, we will move forward to work more, to provide assistance, to provide recommendation to the government how to solve our problems. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor Ujang Sumarwan, for the closing remark. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Erika, we have something special for you guys now. 
Yes, of course. Because we are going to have an awarding for the best presenter as an appreciation to all of you who have participated in this event, especially in the day one exactly. of this conference. So without further ado, let us announce who the winners for the best presenter award. Nur Isyana Wiyan Congratulations to all the winners of the Best Presenter Awards. And we would like to invite one of our winners that attended today. So to Miss so Dr. Melanie Abdul Qadir Sunito, please come forward to join us and give it applause for Dr. Melanie Abdul Qadir Sunito. And the award will be given by the Dean of the Faculty of Human Ecology, Professor Ujang Sumarwan. Okay, thank you. Dr. Thank you so much for you. Professor Ujang Sumarwan and congratulations once again to all the winners of the Best Presenter Awards. And for the winners who join in online, the Certificate of Appreciation will be delivered to you directly by the committee. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now we are at the end of our event. Thank you very much to all the speakers, all the moderators, and all the participants who already participated in day one and day two of this event. We are apologize for any mistake. We hope to see you again face to face next time. I am Erika Mutiara and my partner Arlen Elvide Sudi as Master of Ceremony officially signing out. That's all from us. Thank you very much and see you at the next Ruzet Conference. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, now we're gonna take a picture together. So follow the